Welcome to uh, this debate organized by the Medina Society, uh, Islam and Christianity, the choice. Um, I'm not a student uh, at the university and I'm not a member of the society, but it's uh, a privilege and an honor to have been asked uh, to chair the debate. Um, this evening, we are going to be hearing from three people, although there are more sat on the stage, but not everybody will be speaking. Um, and I will shortly introduce uh, our speakers. Um, I'm firstly just going to set out some basic uh, house rules, which I hope uh, that the speakers uh, and uh, our audience uh, will all uh, abide by. Uh, we're in an academic institution, one of the finest in the country. We want this debate to take place uh, with good academic decorum. So firstly, advice for the speakers uh, to be respectful uh, in your exchanges. Uh, not anticipating any aggression, uh, but if we do get to a point where uh, speakers are getting abusive towards each other, we will have to stop uh, the debate. Um, I'm also going to request that our audience do not heckle uh, when either side uh, is making uh, their statements, uh, nor in anybody else's uh, questions. Uh, if audience members are heckling or being aggressive or abusive in any way towards each other or towards the speakers, we will unfortunately ask uh, for you to leave. We do have uh, colleagues um, who are undertaking security duties uh, this evening. We are hoping we won't have to call on them. Uh, I know the last debate that we held here, uh, we didn't need to, and I'm, I'm sure we won't need their services uh, this evening, but it's good uh, that they're here uh, keeping all of us safe. Um, the format for the debate is very simple. There'll be opening statements from both sides uh, lasting 30 minutes each. Um, Caleb will be starting uh, and then Sheikh Asrar will follow. There'll then be a 20 minute rebuttal from each speaker. This will then be followed by a further 10 minute rebuttal before we open it up uh, to the floor for questions. So it's quite a lengthy debate, it's going to be an epic, uh, but I hope uh, you bear with us. So our speakers this evening, uh, firstly, Caleb Cornerloop, I hope I said that correctly. Cornerloop, uh, street preacher, um, passionate about spreading the word of the gospel, um, from originally from Australia, but living uh, now here uh, in the UK, and, and made some headlines whilst he was in Australia uh, for his campaign uh, for uh, street preaching um, of the Bible, and we're, we're happy that, that you're here uh, this evening. Um, he will uh, be delivering the opening statement, uh, and then after that, the further statements will be delivered by Hatun Tash, who's the director of DCCI Ministries, that's Defend Christ, Critique Islam. Uh, she studied apologetics at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics uh, in Oxford. Um, for those of you who are unaware, Christian Apologetics is a branch of Christian theology uh, that defends uh, Christianity against objections, and she may want to say more about that uh, when she has the time to do so. Uh, Sheikh Asrar, uh, as many of you uh, will be aware looking at this audience, uh, needs no introduction. He's a prominent Islamic scholar and theologian. He studied here uh, in the UK as well as abroad in Syria, and he currently resides in his hometown of Birmingham. He takes a keen interest in matters of belief and creed, Con contemporary geopolitical issues, uh, as well as the classical Islamic understanding um, of the end of times, and I know that's a particular interest of him, uh, of his uh, in, in recent times. Uh, he's a seasoned debater. He's been here before, uh, last year, uh, debate with uh, Guy Otten, yes, uh, the atheist debate, uh, which was very popular, uh, and I'm sure today's will be as equally popular, and we're looking forward to hearing from him today. I think that sorts all the introductions and the house rules. So uh, without further ado, for the first half an hour, I'm going to ask Caleb to deliver his opening statement on Islam and Christianity, the choice.
Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming out to this debate. I want to give a special thank you to Azra Rashid for agreeing to debate with me tonight. He was very hospitable. He invited me around his home in Birmingham, took me out for dinner, and so I just want to thank him for that and um, thank everyone for coming tonight. In my opening statement, I'm going to begin by giving you a definition of the Trinity. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the reliability of the New Testament, the Quran and the Hadiths. And then I'm going to begin to discuss Muhammad and his character as a prophet. Now, when I discuss Muhammad, I want you to know that it is not my intention to offend anyone or to insult anyone's beliefs. My intention is just to discuss this in the context of debate. That's the only uh, context that I'm bringing this up in, and I'm expecting strong arguments against me, so I'm going to bring the strongest arguments I can within this short period of time. But with that being said, let me begin with the definition of the Trinity. Now, both Muslims and Christians believe that there is only one God, but we disagree in our concepts of that one God. As a Christian, I believe in the biblical teaching of the Trinity. Now, if you're a Muslim, you're probably wondering how we're going to give an explanation or a definition of the Trinity. So that's why I've decided to start here. We believe that God is one being, but three persons. Now, you might ask, what is the difference between a being and a person? A being is that quality about you that makes you what you are. I am a human being. And everybody here in this room here tonight are human beings. But a person is that quality about you that makes you who you are. So we say that, so for example, I am Caleb Cornelou. I'm a nice, caring, compassionate person. But what I am, that is a human being, is different to who I am, that is Caleb Cornelou. So we say God is one being, but three persons. Now, that is not a contradiction. If I was to say that God was one being, but three beings, that would be a contradiction. If I was to say God was one person, but three persons, that would be a contradiction. But we say God is one being, but three persons. It is a mystery but it is not a contradiction. Now, Jesus actually mentions this in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus is speaking to his disciples after his resurrection, and he says this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see here that Jesus combines the three persons under the one name, because he sees all three persons as sharing that one divine name. What do we think about the person of Jesus Christ? We believe that Jesus is the eternal, uncreated word of God that has existed from all eternity. Yet at a certain point of time, he came to us and took on flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when we say Jesus took on flesh and became a man, we do not believe that he ceased to be God. Rather, we believe that he took on a human nature in addition to his divine nature so that he had two natures, one divine and one human. This shouldn't be difficult for Muslims to understand because the orthodox Muslim view of the Quran is that the Quran is the eternal, uncreated word of God and yet came down to us through Muhammad and can be held in your hand in the form of a book. So in the same way that Muslims believe the Quran is eternal and uncreated, we believe that Jesus is eternal and uncreated, the uncreated word of God. And in the same way the Quran has come down in the form of a book, we believe Jesus came down in the form of a man. But having said all that, why should you be a Christian and not a Muslim? Both Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus was a prophet. We would have to agree, both Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus was a prophet. And the most reliable source of information about the life and teaching of Jesus is the New Testament documents. We have over 5,852 handwritten copies of the New Testament. Part of, it is, part of these copies are full copies, part of them are just fragmented. We have an additional 10,000 in Latin and an additional 10,000 in languages such as Syriac and Aramaic. Now, it's impossible to go through every book of the Bible, the New Testament, to prove its authenticity, and it's impossible to go through every manuscript for a particular book of the Bible. So I want to just look at two manuscripts of the Gospel of John. 
P52 is uh, housed in John Ryland's library, about 10 minutes walk from here. It's about the size of a credit card and it is dated to 125 AD. That is 35 years from when the original Gospel of John, or Gospel according to John, was written. Now it's only a fragment, so it doesn't prove the whole Gospel, but we have P66, which is dated between 150 and 200 AD, which contains almost the entire Gospel of John. That's between uh, 50 or 60 and 110 years from the original. Now, furthermore, we have wit the witness of the church fathers. <clears throat> St Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers who was executed for his faith by being beheaded, tells us that John wrote the Gospel of John. Now, St Irenaeus gets his information from St Polycarp. St Polycarp gets his information from the Apostle John himself because he was one of the Apostle John's own disciples. How do we know these people are telling the truth? Well, as I said, St Irenaeus was executed for his faith and Polycarp was burned alive and he didn't quite die, so they fed him while he was still alive to wild animals in the Colosseum. So we have a very close connection between the Apostle John, then Polycarp and St Irenaeus. And since these people were martyrs who died for their faith, it's very hard to believe that they would be lying to us about what they tell us. Furthermore, St Irenaeus tells us that all the churches in all the world believed in the four gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They all believed that the Apostle Paul was an apostle of Christ and they all believed that he helped the Apostle Peter establish the church in Rome. Now, in addition to the manuscripts that we have of the New Testament, we also have the writings of the early church fathers. We can construct the entire New Testament from just the writings of the early church fathers within the first 300 years. But why should we believe the early church fathers? Well, as I was saying about Polycarp and St Irenaeus, the early church suffered almost 300 years of heavy persecution that would really make the persecution under ISIS look like it was being done by a bunch of choir boys. The uh, early Christians were crucified, beheaded, they were flogged to death and when they were flogged to death you would see the inner organs of their body and you would see the entrails of their body. They were fed to wild animals, burned alive and torn apart by horses, limb by limb attached to separate horses and their bodies ripped apart. And the bishops were always the first ones to go. For example, St Irenaeus, when he took on his bishopric, the bishop before him had just been martyred himself. So it was a very dangerous thing to be a Christian and there was no money in it, that is for sure. But oftentimes some Muslims try to argue that we don't have the originals and therefore the ones we have must be corrupted. But it's worth noting that we do not have the original Quran either. We do not have the parchments that were written down on during the life of Muhammad. We do not have Abu Bakr's copy at all. We have none of the copies that were done under Uthman. We have no Quranic manuscript at all from the 7th century, which is the century that Muhammad died. The earliest Quranic manuscripts we have are from the 8th, and ninth centuries. Now, although the animal hide of the Sana manuscript dates to the sixth century, the text itself is dated to seven, between 710 and 715 AD. That's 78 to 83 years after Muhammad died. And the Sana manuscript as well that is dated to that time contains only 63 verses out of 6,236 verses of the Quran. But what's even more staggering is the oldest copy of Sahih Bukhari. The oldest copy of Sahih Bukhari is dated to 1000 AD, both paleographically and chemically. That's 368 years after Muhammad died. In fact, there is no hadith that dates earlier than 1000 AD. And this hadith, this manuscript of Sahih Bukhari, contains only three books. The Book of Taxes, the Book of Fasting and the Book of Pilgrimage. And only the Book of Taxes is complete. The next manuscript of Sahih Bukhari is dated to 1150 AD. That's over 500 years after Muhammad died. Sometimes Muslims like to bring up the variants or, or Bible critics like to bring up the variants within the New Testament. When Sahih Bukhari, sorry, when Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim and other uh, Imams collected the hadiths, Muslims know that they sorted through hundreds of thousands of hadith stories that were being circulated about Muhammad within 200 years of his lifetime. The number can go up into over a million. So if we talk about variants, we've got a big problem when it comes to the hadiths. So I would argue that if you think Sahih Bukhari is reliable, 
then you should have no problems accepting the reliability of the New Testament. That is the first reason why I think that you should be a Christian. The second reason is that the central message of the Christian faith was prophesied in the Jewish scriptures and remains there even to this day. There is uh, many prophecies that I could look at in the Jewish scriptures, but I'm going to look at one in particular, and that is in Isaiah chapter 53. And this was written 700 years before Jesus was born, and we have copies of it that date between 150 to 300 years before Jesus was born. So this was written well in advance. So Isaiah 53, and I want to just read you two verses. You can read the uh, chapter in your own time if you like. Verses 4 to 6. This is what it says. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, that is peace with God, was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The passage goes on to say that he was cut off out of the land of the living and was buried, but God saw the travail of his soul and brought him to life and prolonged his days. This is a very clear prophecy of somebody bearing the sins of the people of Israel, of all of his people, and it says the iniquity of us all, and suffering in their place for their sin and bringing peace between them and God through his suffering. Jesus interestingly applied this prophecy to himself in the gospel of luke chapter 24 verses 46 and onwards and there's many uh, places in the gospels i could read to you but let me read you this one this is again after the resurrection of jesus it says this then he referring to jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures he told them this is what is written the messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So here we have Jesus in the gospel applying this kind of prophecy to himself, saying that the Messiah must suffer for sins just as the gospel says. Now, this is also confirmed in the historical records of the Roman Empire. The first century AD, there was a man named Tacitus who was the uh, proconsul of Rome in his time, very high position, second only to the emperor, and he records the death of Jesus in the annals of imperial Rome, saying that Jesus was killed under Pontius Pilate with the extreme death penalty. So the Christian faith is rooted in history, in prophecy, and in reliable records such as the Gospels. Having said that, why do I think that you should not be a Muslim? First of all, the Quran fails to engage meaningfully with the Christian concept of the Trinity. If you're a Christian, and there's not many Christians in the room here tonight, but when I first began reading the Quran, the first thing I noticed is that the author of the Quran didn't seem to understand what the Trinity was. And every time it tried to attack the Trinity, it was attacking a straw man argument. For example, it speaks of the Trinity as the Father, Mary, and the Son. It speaks of the Trinity as three separate gods. You see, so the author of the Quran doesn't seem to understand what the Trinity is. In fact, Muslims today are far better at their attempts to combat the Trinity than what the author of the Quran was when it was written in Muhammad's time. The second reason why you should not be a Muslim is because Muhammad is not mentioned in the Torah or sorry. Sorry. The second reason why you should not be a Muslim is because the uh, Muhammad is not mentioned in the Torah or the gospel. Why is this important? In Surah chapter 7, verse 157, we read this. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, i.e. Muhammad, whom they find written with them in the Torah and the gospel with them. You see, this surah is saying that you can find Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the gospel that was with the Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad. Now, we have at least 85 Taurus uh, manuscripts from before, 150 to 300 years before Jesus was born, let alone Muhammad, and yet there is no mention in them of Muhammad whatsoever. 
The third reason why I think you should not be a Muslim is because Muhammad was not a good example to follow. Now, again, I want to stress that it is not my intention to offend anyone. I'm expecting strong arguments against me, and so I'm going to bring some strong arguments here. It says in uh, Surah chapter 33, verse 21, Indeed, in the messenger of Allah, Muhammad, you have a good example to follow. And I'm going to bring up the issue of Aisha. In Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 5134, we read this, narrated by Aisha, that the Prophet married her when she was six years old and he consummated, he, he consummated his marriage with her when she was nine years old. Hishem said, I have been informed that Aisha remained with the Prophet for nine years until his death. Now, Muhammad died at 61 years of age, which means that when he married Aisha at the age of six, he was 52. And when he consummated the marriage, he was 55 and she was nine. Now, hands up how many people would give away their daughter, a nine-year-old daughter, to a 55-year-old man? Do we have any people 55 year old, years old and older here that we can you know, connect with you? I don't think we would seriously do that. I, I don't think we would seriously do that. Secondly, there is good reason to believe that Aisha was prepubescent when the marriage was consummated. In Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 6130, we read this, and this is before the marriage, narrated again by Aisha. I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves. So these were little girls that would, would hide because the messenger was coming. But the Prophet would call them to join and to play with me. And then it says this, The playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl not yet reached the age of puberty. Now then we read in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 3309, narrated again by Aisha. Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine and her dolls were with her. So the previous hadith said she was allowed to play with dolls because she was prepubescent. And here we say, it says in this uh, Sahih hadith, that she was also taking her dolls with her when her marriage was consummated. And might I add, I've never read any hadith which would suggest that she was not prepubescent. And this is very strong evidence to suggest that she was indeed prepubescent when she was married. Therefore, Muhammad is not a good example to follow, and the Quran is false. There are many other hadiths that talk about this, by the way. The second reason why Muhammad is not a good example to follow is because Muhammad married his adopted son's wife. There's a story in the history of Al Tabari, volume 8, pages 2 and 3 in the English translation. When Muhammad went and visited his adopted son, Zayed ibn Muhammad, Zayed son of Muhammad. And Zayed wasn't home, but his wife was home. And when she got up to answer the door, Al Tabari tells us that Muhammad was aroused by her. And he turned away and he said, Glory be to God, glory be to God, glory be to God. Now, Zayed later found out about this and he offered his wife to Muhammad and said he would divorce her. Initially, Muhammad didn't accept it. And so then Zayed, he couldn't look at his wife. This is in Al-Tabari. This is not me. This is Al-Tabari that says this. He couldn't look at his wife the same anymore and he divorced her. And then Muhammad received a revelation permitting him to marry his adopted son's wife and that is in the Quran. And the saddest part of this story is that because the Arabs considered that it was an act of incest at the time, Muhammad then received another revelation, which is in the Quran, cancelling and making void all adoption. And even to this day, Muslims cannot adopt a child and cannot pass their name onto them. So for this reason, I would argue again that Muhammad is not of good character, he is not a person we should follow, and the Quran is false. Second, uh, another reason why you should not be a Muslim is that Muhammad did not respect the institution of marriage. In Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 5118, we read this. While we were in the army, Allah's messenger came to us and said, you have been allowed to do the mutta marriage, so do it. Now, mutta marriage is marriage for lust. It's temporary marriage. And in the very next Hadith, Sahih Bukhari 5119, it says that this mutta marriage, marriage for lust, could last as little as three days. 
three days. Now, what is the point of having the institution of marriage if it will only last for three days? This is not the kind of thing that messengers from God should be advocating. Therefore, Muhammad is not a good example and the Quran is false. Now, this last one, this is the last one about marriage, is in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 3371. Now, Muhammad at this point, uh, his armies were out, they were uh, fighting their enemies, and his soldiers were away from their wives. And it says in this hadith, when you read it, that they were suffering from being away from their wives, and so they were sleeping with their captive slave women. And they wanted to sell the slave women after sleeping with them, and so they were withdrawing before you know what, so that they wouldn't get them pregnant. And then one of them went to Muhammad and said, do we even need to do this? And Muhammad said they didn't need to do it, for whoever will be born will be born. So Muhammad, and you cannot say this is consenting sex, because they were still planning on selling them. Read the hadith for yourself. They were still planning on selling them after they had had intercourse with them. But let me just say quickly, it is not my intention to insult anyone. I think the Muslim community here is nothing like this, very friendly, kind, hospitable people. And so this is not a reflection of how I think about you. This is just an academic debate about Muhammad. The last and final reason why I would reject Muhammad as a prophet is because Muhammad's death proves that he fabricated the Quran. In Surah 69, verses 44 to 47, we read this. And if he, Muhammad, had forged a saying concerning us, Allah, we surely would have seized him by his right hand or with power and might and then certainly would have cut off his life artery, his aorta, and none of you could withhold us from punishing him. Now, may I suggest this is exactly how Muhammad died. After Muhammad had attacked a Jewish town, a woman who had become a widow as a result of the battle brought a meal to Muhammad, found out what his favourite meal was and poisoned it. And Muhammad ate it and was poisoned. And as he was dying, he says this in Sahih Bukhari, volume 5, book 59, hadith number 713, narrated by Aisha again. The prophet in his ailment in which, his di in which he died used to say, O oh Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaaba, And at this time, I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. Muhammad died in the exact way he said he would die if he was fabricating the Quran. Now, this wasn't a quick death. This was actually a long, slow, painful death which lasted three years. Now, some Muslims try to argue that the meaning of the word aorta in the Quran is uh, that the word originally translated is different to the one in the Hadith. And this is true. But the transla both words mean exactly the same thing. The translation I'm reading from is the Mushan Khan translation. His translation of the Quran is authorised by the University of Medina and the Hadith is also translated by Mushan Khan. Not only that, but Mushan Khan is actually a, has a degree in medicine and surgery and he worked for the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia. So he knows what the aorta is. The aorta is the vein that pumps blood from the heart to the rest of the body. And Muhammad died by that poison, cutting through his aorta and causing internal bleeding. I want to close just by talking a little bit about sin. There is a hadith which I think is very good. It's in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 6308. And it says this, A believer sees his sins as if he were sitting under a mountain. He is afraid it may fall on him. Whereas a wicked person considers his sins as flies passing over his nose and he just drives them away like this. My question to you is how do you view your personal sin in your life? Do you view it as a mountain that is going to come down upon you? Or do you view your sin as a fly, as flies around your nose to wave away? When people say that, can't God just forgive me? There's little sins and big sins. This is looking at your sin as though it's just flies buzzing around your nose that you can brush away. Christians view sin as though it was a mountain about to fall down upon them. And that is why we look to Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus Christ and his substitutionary death, who he, when he voluntarily took our place and took our suffering, his death is the only way that we can find forgiveness for our sins. Is that my time? We've got two minutes. 
three minutes. I want to ask you just quickly, if we were to have an election for a prime minister between Jesus and Muhammad, and their life was their manifesto, who would you vote for? Would you vote for Jesus or would you vote for Muhammad? As a Christian, I don't need to vote for Muhammad. I would vote for Jesus, 100%. Jesus is the perfect example of holiness. Jesus is the perfect example of love. Jesus is the perfect example of compassion. And Jesus is the perfect example of mercy. And it is through Jesus alone that we can find salvation. So I want to just, I can pass on to you now, so I'm finished. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, okay, we'll finish with uh, just, well, just under three minutes to spare. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm now going to ask Sheikh Asrar uh, to give his opening statement. Uh, again, uh, he's allotted uh, 30 minutes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> If you notice in the presentation, not a single verse of the Quran was quoted. The individual, uh, my interlocutor, went straight onto the hadith. That's like me not quoting the Bible to Christians and moving on to extra religious literature because hadith is not above criticism. Even Sahih al Bukhari, there is, like you have criticism, a Bible criticism, there is a critical m method of reading hadith literature when, <coughs> when a hadith report is solitary in its nature, the text can be criticized by scholars. Even though they say sahih, what they mean by sahih is that the overall work is sahih. Individual schools have rejected solitary reports. Solitary reports means one person comes along and says, this occurred. A scholar can come along and criticize that narrator and say that this narration is incorrect. This is found throughout the Islamic works, Fatul Bari and other works. But you will notice child marriage is prohibited in the Qur'an. But that was not quoted. Child mal marriage is prohibited in the Qur'an. So when Muslims read a hadith which contradicts the Qur'an, they can reject the hadith, but they do not reject the Qur'an. Secondly, the, the hadith relating to the marriage of Aisha, there was a method of the Arabs that when they would pass th into their teen years, they would mention their age through the numbers. They would say, for instance, I was seven years old, and this happens in Bukhari as well. One of the companions, he says, I would lead my tribe when I was seven years old. I would lead them in the prayer. Every Muslim knows that a seven-year-old is not permitted to lead the prayer. What that companion meant, he was 17 years old. And this is also a Jewish habit also. So many of the scholars, when they read that hadith of Aisha, uh, radiallahu anha, they say that this, because Aisha was cognizant of what was occurring, she's reporting the event herself. A six-year-old doesn't, uh, have cognizance of, a, of what is occurring. So they state that the age was in her teen years. Many of them have said that. But even if someone does not acknowledge that, the age of consent changes from anthropologically from time to time. You come from Australia, where you killed off the Aborigine people. The Aborigine people had their own culture and way of doing things. When the white Christian went there, they killed off the Aborigine people. But the Aborigine people, they had their own culture. In the Arab world, nine was the age of consent meaning a woman, a girl was considered a woman for consummation of marriage at the age of nine. In Yemen, the law was only changed recently. So anthropologists will tell you that you do not judge a culture with your modern outlook on a previous ancient culture. This is, of course, even the Christian uh, apologetics and criticism of the marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha was only brought up after the 1900s. No Christian ever brought up the marriage of Aisha prior to the 1900s. Why? Because the standards had changed, cultures changed. A woman was no longer considered a woman at the age of nine because of mental maturity, and therefore the law changed with time. So when Christians bring up the marriage of Aisha, they fail. For instance, in the Enci Catholic Encyclopedia, of course, being an evangel evangelist, you will deny the Catholic interpretation. They mentioned Mary was only 12 years old at the time, but you can easily reject that. But you went straight from the Quran to the Hadith. Now there is a reason for that. Hadith has categories. There are Hadith which are accepted, there are Hadith which are not accepted, and there are Hadith which may be classified as Sahih, but the text goes through criticism, scholarly criticism. Scholars can come along and critique the actual text of the Hadith. 
it was good. I will go back on to some of your points. What I wanted to present first was that some of the things that you mentioned <coughs> were relevant to what I wanted to mention. For instance, hypostatic unity, which is with regard to uh, Trinity. You mentioned being and person. I will, in, in fact, qualify your statement for you. What you mean to say, God is one entity with various attributes. This is what you intend to say. But you use the word being and person, the correct term would be entity and quality, meaning God is one entity with three qualities. Is that God the God of the Old Testament or not? Meaning Jesus is the quality of God. Uh, you mentioned the Quran being the word of God. What that entails is that God has a divine attribute known as kalam, speech. But the, the Quran that we have revealed to us signifies that divine speech. For instance, if I write down the word Allah on a piece of paper, and you read out the word Allah, this written word signifies the name of God. The revealed Quran that we have signifies the divine attribute of God. It doesn't mean that God's divine attribute is transmuted into flesh onto earth or into paper onto earth. It means that the written word and the spoken word alludes and signifies to the word of God. This is the meaning of the divine speech of Allah. So with regard to Jesus being a quality of God that descended and became God in the flesh, this same God that you mentioned with your reasoning, we should reject the Bible also. Because in the Old Testament, and I will go on to the verses in the New Testament which mention killing also, it's not without any wonder that you have soldiers of Christ here. Meaning since when did uh, Jesus have soldiers? Here you have, in, in for instance, 1 Samuel 15, uh, you have where Samuel is commanded, what he said, Samuel said to Saul, I am the, I mean, this is divine revelation, I am the one, the Lord, this is the Lord, meaning the same entity that you believe Jesus is an attribute of, sent to anoint you king over his people, uh, his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel. No wonder today we have the IDF carrying out acts uh, today in occupied Palestine. Listen to what type of things the God of the Old Testament, which is the same entity as Christ according to your reasoning, which states, Say, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. They didn't even spare the donkeys. This is the God of the Old Testament. So by your reasoning and logic, we should uh, totally discard the Old Testament first. But by logic and reasoning, we should also discard the New Testament because according to you, Jesus is one of the attributes of God as the word you use, the person, one of the persons of one being. They are one being, but he is one of the persons. Why didn't Jesus object to the Father and say this is unjust? And secondly, how do you even define that law is evil? You go to Euthyphro's dilemma here. How do you define what is evil? Is evil defined by the scripture or is evil defined? And I guarantee these questions will not be answered adequately. Is evil defined by the mind or is evil defined by the culture or is evil defined by the scripture? Which one do you resort to? How do you actually define evil? So when you say, Jesus and the God of the Old Testament <coughs> are one person, this would bring me to my first question, which is, is Jesus the God of the Old Testament or a different God? But you've answered that, you said they are one entity, the terms you used is one being, different persons. So then, therefore, why didn't Jesus object to this? Second question was, where is the gospel of Jesus in his own tongue, Aramaic? Surprisingly, you mentioned manuscripts in Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic. In the Bible, we only find a few, in the New Testament, we only find a few statements of Eloi, Eloi, Lima, Sabachthani. Why is this retained? What they did, in fact, the canonization of the Bible occurred 300 years later. With the Quran, you mentioned the authenticity of the transmission of the Quran. In Uthman's time, we may use the term the recension of Uthman. We can say 18 years after the Prophet. If we accept your argument that Uthman was the one who canonized the Quran, 18 years after the passing away of the Prophet. But you mentioned physical copies. Physical copies, you will know every year the Muslims pray taraweeh. When they pray taraweeh, what do they do? They recite the entire Quran. This has been occurring in Mecca for over 1400 years. In fact, near, nearly 1420 years, the entire Quran is recited every year by memory. There are people in this uh, auditorium that if the Quran was burnt 
and finished, they could recite the entire Quran from their heart. Not a single Christian to this day has memorized the entire Bible or even the New Testament. In fact, not even, the, uh, meaning you can never have someone leading the prayer and reciting the entire New Testament. So the Quran was memorized from its very revelation. 110,000 companions had memorized parts of the Quran or the entire Quran. <clears throat> so, uh, four were mentioned by the Prophet as mastering the Quran. They had mastered the Quran and they taught it to thousands. So even if the manuscripts were lost, which they weren't, by the way, there, are, there is in Tashkent, in Russia, a manuscript ascribed to Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So <clears throat> with the Bible on the other hand, Jesus spoke Aramaic. What they did is that you mentioned the Apostle John and uh, the chain of narration back to John. Biblical scholars acknowledge that John did not even write the uh, testament that we have the Gospel of John. This Gospel of John was not written by the Apostle John. The author is someone else. You can check your own Schofield or any of the uh, commentaries on the Bible. You will find that John did not even write those Bibles. But when they were written, they were written in the Hellenistic Greco-Roman culture of the time. In order to satisfy the Greco appetites for polytheism, Jesus was transmuted into a demigod, which was not the original belief of Jesus himself. Muslims believe in the original Aramaic by, uh, gospel of Jesus, that Jesus spoke in the Aramaic language. Someone may say, what's so important about that language? If you translate a statement from Aramaic to Greek, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to English, the statement will lose its nuance. The statement will lose its r real import. And this is what happens with the Bible, if it is translated, or the Quran, the Quran was revealed in Arabic. If you translate the Quran from Arabic to Persian, from Persian to Urdu, from Urdu to English, you would lose the original meanings. And this is what occurred. Uh, the canonization occurred 300 years after. Apocryphal texts were rejected. And uh, when Constantine, he adopted the Christian creed, and Constantine was the one who did the canonization of the Bible, Constantine was the founder of the Catholic Church that you hate and despise so much. They, that council of Nicaea, meaning the, the church was founded in Rome, this is what I mean, from that chain of narration, the, the modern Catholic Church claims its roots back to Constantine. That canonization occurred at that time and the apocryphal texts were rejected. The canonization occurred 300 years later, but the Quran, you mentioned the transmission of the Quran. Some ridiculous things some people bring up, they say the Quran has variants because of the Qira'at. This, of course, would work on an ignorant audience, but what the Qira'at entail is different pronunciations of the same word. For instance, you say Maliki Yawmiddin, you say Maliki Yawmiddin. Wadduha, uh, Wadduha, just different pronunciation. There's no variants there on, because the, the agreed upon Quran occurred in the time of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So. If we use your reasoning regarding the, and th there are other differences also, aside from memorization, there is mass transmission of the Quran, thousands of people have narrated it by memory in each generation, and likewise the language it is written in its original language, the Bible, the gospel of Jesus is not found today. Meaning, you read uh, through the four gospels of the authors of the gospels, you'll find Jesus went and preached the gospel. What gospel was Jesus preaching? This gospel that was written in Aramaic is the gospel that is intended in the Quran, that this Injil is the real Injil, not these, uh, meaning uh, you'll find Luke and Matthew copy from Mark. They copy from Mark. The work of Mark was written first, then Matthew and Luke copy from him. And what do we mean by variants? Variants, someone will say the Quran has variants. So one person will claim this is a part of the Quran or that is a part of the Quran. But today you will not find a single Muslim saying uh, uh, this verse should be taken out of the Quran and they'd remove the verse from the Quran and then add a verse back into the Quran. But you will find this with biblical scholarship. For instance, you all know, so well many of you know, regarding the Revised Standard Version, how Mark, the verses in Mark were removed and then they were added back because they said the manuscripts are not reliable. That doesn't work with Islam. If you find manuscripts that contradict the memorization, we rely on the memorization first because any Tom, Dick and Harry can come and write something, place that away in, in the soil. A thousand years later, someone opens it and says, oh, this contradicts the Quran. But if thousands of people have memorized the Quran from generation to generation to generation, whatever piece of paper we may find that contradicts that, we will reject it because the memorization has been transmitted from generation to generation. So the third thing that I wanted to mention to you 
is who has the right to abrogate the law of after Jesus had not abrogated the law. If Jesus had not abrogated the law, what right was there of Paul, who, uh, Saul, to, to abrogate the law? The law was uh, fulfilled by Jesus, and Muslims accept this. Jesus accepted wholeheartedly the law of the Old Testament, but Jesus came to teach the Jews the spirituality. And when he was asked regarding the Gentiles, what did he say? Why should I give, uh, give the bread to what? To the dogs. He referred to Gentiles as dogs, Jesus, according to the New Testament. Muslims, when they read this, they do not ascribe that to Jesus. We have a different methodology. If there is something wrong ascribed to Jesus, we reject it. Like in the Bible, you find a ascription of incest to Lot, the prophet Lot, slept with his two daughters. Or to Jacob, Jacob slept with his own daughter-in-law. Why do you not mention this? By your reasoning, Jacob is not a prophet of God. By your reasoning, Lot is not a prophet of God. Why? Because they did these acts. Jacob should be rejected as a prophet. Likewise, Lot should be rejected as a prophet because according to you, <clears throat> and how do you even define evil? Meaning a man sleeping with his own daughters, or you'll say this was not done by his own volition, they made him drink alcohol, okay, but the, the Bible does not condemn it, it doesn't punish the God of the Bible doesn't, doesn't punish the two daughters of Lot, but it punished the whole town of homosexuals. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, but a, a, a two daughters who give alcohol to their dad and they sleep with him and they become pregnant, they are not punished. This is the God, meaning he punishes the, the town for homosexuality and he doesn't punish the two daughters who commit incest with their own father. Likewise, Jacob, he commits incest with his a daughter-in-law, and when he commits incest, the ancestors of Jesus are born. So in the lineage of Jesus that we find in the New Testament, uh, there's impurity in the lineage, which Muslims will reject. Muslims will read that and say, we cannot accept impurity in the lineage of Jesus. We as Muslims, but Christians won't uh, reject it, but we will say there can never be an illegitimate child in the lineage of Jesus. In the lineage of Jesus. So we reject that. We say Jesus was born of pure birth. He was born a pure lineage. So who has the right to abrogate the law? You find, for instance, Jesus, when he mentions here in uh, Matthew, for instance, I have uh, this passage marked off, which is, makes interesting that Jesus says that you cannot even refer to people as fools, meaning, which is such a great teaching, that Jesus came to uh, fulfill uh, the law. Uh, Jesus mentions that he came to fulfill the law here in Matthew, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands, commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven for i tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the pharisees and the teachers of the law you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven you have heard that it was said to the people long ago do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment but i tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother without cause will be subject to judgment again Anyone who says to his brother, uh, the word is raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Meaning, if, you, if Christians are to preach to Muslims, they even use words like fool, they break the law of Jesus. Meaning Jesus is prohibited for even any bad language being used. So <clears throat> Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abrogate the law. So the question remains, who abrogated circumcision? Was it Jesus? Who abrogated the, the, the laws of eating, meaning these restrictions of eating swine, that uh, Christians eat swine and Jesus never ate the swine. Jesus followed the law. Jesus did not violate the law. In fact, what was the purpose of Jesus turning the tables in the, in the masjid, in al-masjid al-aqsa, the, the temple mount, turning the tables upside down? Why? Because they were carrying out a usury. The Jews were doing usury, yet you have Protestant Christianity allowing usury. Once they turned against the Catholic Church, they allowed usury, and usury now prevails in the Christian world and the rest of the world. So they abolished the law. Who has this right of uh, doing this? Likewise, in the book of Exodus, for instance, you mentioned slavery in the Hadith. Scholars can come along and criticize the Hadith. There's no restriction. 
unless the hadith is mutawatir, meaning you need to know what is mutawatir, they make a distinction. Read the verses of slavery in the Quran. The verses of slavery in the Quran, they mention ma malakat imanukum, they give permission for sexual intercourse between a man who owns a slave in that time. Why did they do this? Because the slavery was so prevalent amongst the Arabs that the Quran did not sanction slavery. It regulated the slavery and it abolished many forms of slavery. But did Paul do this? The answer is no. If you check, uh, uh, you check the uh, Colossians, for instance, chapter three, verse twenty-two, slavery and Paul, you will find where Paul uh, tells the slaves to obey their master. Likewise, Ephesians uh, chapter six, verse five. Meaning, if you go and check, you will find Paul. He had time to abolish the circumcision. He had time to abolish the, uh, the laws of eating, and they even ascribed this to Peter, Kephas, the, the apostle Kephas. But uh, did he abolish slavery? The answer is no. Why didn't Paul abolish slavery? This is a question that remains. Likewise, the, if you check Jesus, what he states regarding his own enemies, in Luke 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 27, uh, the, the Gideon version of the Bible, which I have, this uh, Gideon version, you, you will uh, find that Jesus uses more violent language according to the translation. And this is the problem with translation. Muslims, when they read this, they will say, Jesus may, uh, did not say this, or they may interpret this. But <coughs> according to Luke chapter 19, verse 27, we find that Jesus says regarding his enemies, that he says, the full, the full entire quote. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what he has, be, has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be a king over them, meaning the Jews, they didn't want him to be a king, and the Romans at the time, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Meaning any verse could be decontextualized, sometimes by Muslims, sometimes by Christians, but there is a higher criticism of any text that we uh, may read. So, likewise, according to the New Testament, Jesus is cursed. It, many people are unaware of this. Why? Because of the curse of the law. You find, for instance, I mean, this was, of course, uh, something that Muslims will also reject, because what do they say? All, I mean, who's writing this? Paul. Not Jesus, not Jesus, Paul is writing this. He states, all who rely, I mean, this is ascribed to Paul, even though if you check the history hist hist of the, the New Testament, you'll find they cannot even uh, verify who the authors are. At least we know who Bukhari was when he was born, when he died. You said Bukhari was one of the, the uh, earliest manuscripts of Bukhari. Again, are you unaware that there are manuscripts of hadith which are available today, which were written before Bukhari, that contain the same hadith as Bukhari? They're, they're available. Go and check Dr. Hamidullah, Dr. Hamidullah's uh, research on this. The manuscripts are available in the museums. You can, the manuscripts are written uh, down. Uh, the hadiths that are in Bukhari are found in those works. So what does it state? It states, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. So Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, but Paul is telling us all those who rely on the law are under a curse, for it is written. Cursed is, is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law. Clearly no one is justified by, before by God by the law, before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law has not based on faith, on the contrary. The man who does these things, by the way, this contradicts James, the, the uh, brother of Jesus. If you read the book of James, James says otherwise. James affirms the law and action. James is contradicting Paul. James was the leader of the real, the real followers of Christ. Paul contradicted him, and this is why they had nearly four meetings in Jerusalem. Four meetings, because Paul wanted to abolish the law, and James opposed him. James opposed him in this. There was an early disagreement amongst uh, the, real, uh, the real companions of Jesus and the supposed companion, because how do we know even Paul was a companion? Paul tells us in a vision. He saw Jesus in a vision. This is why you have so many false prophets in America today. Every other man will claim that he saw Jesus and will come out with his own interpretation. What does Paul say? The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And Christ became a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And anyone who is hung on a tree, meaning Jesus was crucified, he has become a curse. But you know, they cannot even decide, was he hung on a tree or a cross? So it states, 
He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Paul changed the teachings of Jesus in order to, to uh, preach, the te- uh, to distort and give the teaching to the Gentiles. Those same Gentiles that Jesus said he shall not cast the bread to the dogs. Meaning Jesus said he shall not preach to the Gentiles. Even the woman who came to Jesus and Jesus rejected her. Why? Because she's from the Gentiles and then later Jesus accepted her. Read those accounts in the New Testament. Paul abolished the law. So why did Paul have the authority to abolish the law? Likewise, there are uh, <clears throat> a few other things which should be mentioned. With uh, regard to muta. you mentioned uh, muta. If you had bothered to read the whole Sahih Bukhari, like I read the entire Bible. I read the entire Bible before coming. I gave respect to the Bible by reading the Bible. Please do not just read Answering Christianity, uh, Answering Islam or Answering Christianity.com, polemicist website. Come with a serious study. If you had read, the Prophet, peace be upon him, abrogated muta. He abrogated the, the action of muta. Muta was a practice that was done by the people prior to Islam. And the Prophet for a while left the practice. But toward the end of his life, he, he abrogated the entire practice. And then Umar the Caliph was the one who enforced the abrogation of the practice of Mutah. So a person should at least respect the, the, uh, the literature that he studies. Likewise, when we mention variants, we have 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7 mentions uh, that there are three who bear witness in the heavens. God the Father, God the Spirit, and many of you Christians will know the verses, and God, uh, the uh, Holy Spirit and the Son. Th- that is found in the Gideon version. But then when I check the Revised Standard Version, it's not found. Is this the Word of God or is this the Word of God? You will try to attempt to say this is in the Quran as well, with the Hafs and uh, Warsh, I'm sorry. Hafs and Warsh is just a linguistical difference of pronouncing words. There is no contradiction. There is no contradiction. Like, Qira'atu uh, Hafs, Maliki Yawmiddin. Qira'atu Warsh, Maliki Yawmiddin. Just a distinction in how the word is recited. But they are not different, in, they are not variants. Uh, um, uh, the Shia or the, the Wahhabis or the Sunnis, the main three sects, uh, they, ha- they wouldn't come with a different Quran and say, this verse should be taken out. But in the 200 denominations we find in America, there are people who follow the King James Version. There are people who follow the Revised Standard Version. There are people who use different Bibles, and some of them will dispute some of those verses. Going back to some of your uh, additional points that you mentioned, uh, regarding the character of the, uh, the Prophet, you mentioned uh, the marriage of Aisha. You mentioned Tabari and uh, the, the marriage of the Prophet to the, his cousin. Firstly, the Prophet, peace be upon him, saw his cousin Zainab throughout her life. He grew up with her. He saw her beauty throughout his life, and he never lusted after her. You mentioned the source Tabari. Tabari is a source that was compiled 300 years after the Prophet. Am I call a, a work that, in one sense, I acknowledge the fact that you are comparing Tabari to the Bible. That is correct. You cannot compare the Quran to the Bible. That's good. But Tabari can be compared to the Bible, meaning you can accept and reject verses from the Bible. You can accept and reject verses from Tabari. Tabari has, he, if you read his uh, tafsir, he mentions he placed everything that is authentic and not authentic into Tabari for sourcing purposes, not for saying this is our religion. Tabari is not such a work, meaning there are verses, uh, there are narrations in Tabari that you will find that are totally false. This is one of them that he placed. And if you check the backdrop to that, you will find who the people were who concocted that story. So the Prophet saw Zainab all his life. When he saw Zainab all his life, he never lusted for her in his youth. When he reached, and by the way, his marriages occurred after the age of 50, meaning the multiple marriages. Why? Because they were widow women and women who had no one to support them that the Prophet had married. And some of them did not even have sex with him. They did not have even sexual intercourse. They, they forfeited their days. They said they do not want that right. So he did not marry for sexual intercourse. Uh, and I've already covered the marriage of Aisha, which is a favorite of polemicists, Christian polemicists, because they cannot go to, do you note, know, the Christians cannot never critique our concept of God. They have to start from the character of the prophet. But as I mentioned, if you critique the character of the prophet, then all the prophets in the Old Testament are rejected. Solomon man- married thousands, uh, hundreds of women. And I mentioned Noah is naked and drunk in the uh, Old Testament. All the prophets should be rejected. But those things that you mentioned uh, regarding our prophet, uh, those things uh, I mentioned that the source is uh, 
that you mentioned are not similar to the Quran. They are sources that can be uh, critiqued. So going back to my initial argument, is the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament the same? If you say we have a new covenant, if you have a new covenant, then the old covenant, was God correct in the old covenant or was he wrong in the old covenant? Meaning if you reject the Quran based on law, then you should reject the Old Testament on law. Why this double standard? Uh, my time is nearly finished. Uh, the additional point was regarding the, uh, the gospel of Jesus. Where is it? And the third point, who has the right to abrogate the law? Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you to Sheikh Asrar uh, for his 30-minute uh, uh, opening statement. Uh, just before we continue, I know there are people still coming. Those who are sat on the edges, if you wouldn't mind moving in one or two seats so that those who do arrive uh, can find somewhere to sit quite easily. So if you sat on the edge, just shuffle up a couple of seats um, so that when people come, they can just easily uh, find a seat. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Hartoum Tash uh, for her 20-minute rebuttal. I get three minutes notice or just let's uh, stop? I, I will give you the three minute okay. notice. Uh, if you can just put on the other mic as well, please, because that's, uh, that's a sound mic. Oh. Should we start that again? Just <laughs> There you go. Okay, um, we can settle down again. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, sir. Um, I must say, I am very disappointed because within 30 minutes, I would expect as a Christian, when the topic is Islam or Christianity, choosing the right path, I would expect to hear actually, why should I be Muslim and why should I reject Christian faith? Sadly, I did not get any respond, I didn't even uh, hear why uh, Muslims are Muslim today. So I've got five, five pages, six pages to rebuttal to go. So I'll do my best and then I'll kind of go through them as in order. <clears throat> I think I'll start with the last one towards end. This is because it came up a couple of times. Um, my brother gave a couple of reasons on Christian God as well as why he cannot be Muslim because of the teachings of Muhammad and his actions. For us as a Christian and for you as a Muslim, one of your way, one of the way that you will learn how to live as a Muslim, you would go to Hadith. It is the Hadith. <coughs> Sorry, it is the hadith you would go. I, when I look into the Quran, I will not get to hear the actions of Muhammad, even though Quran tells Muslims they must obey Allah and they must obey Muhammad. For you to obey Muhammad, you have to go to the hadith. I am, a dis I am disappointed that Muslims are simply rejecting the Sahih Bukhari hadiths. I will come to that as we go on. Also, I am disappointed that even though we went to Sahih Bukhari, Muslims simply thinking that actually you just go to the website, go to the Google Sheikh uh, or, uh, or Muslim polemics website, Christian polemics website, and then you do your research from that. I think that's simply not true because those references are coming from Hadith. And I don't think there is anything wrong to be polemist, because I would say, if you are all Muslims, you would agree with me, 
Muhammad is one of the best polemists out there so far, according to Islamic tradition. He does critique other religions, and there is nothing wrong with that. We heard today in the opening statement, while nothing about why Muslims are Muslims or why should be I Muslim, we heard that Sahih hadiths might not, might not be Sahih. Approximate one th over 1,000 years ago, early Muslim scholars walked around Saudi Arabia. As they did their research, they put together what is reliable, what is not. Bukhari, who was not even from time, uh, time period of Muhammad, Arabic wasn't his first language. He traveled all the way from Bukhara, from Persian Empire, and he collected approximately 600,000 hadith. And today you've got only 7,295 of them because he already rejected 98%. I think it is not fair to early Muslim scholars that 21st century Muslim scholars simply reject what it, it is written in it. That's not fair. Um, question, objection came in the opening statement regarding uh, m m child marriage um, of Mo Muhammad marrying with a child. And argument came, actually, it might be in Hadith, even though there is age issues, but it is forbidden in the Quran. I think you would agree with me that's simply not true. Surah 65, verse 4, talking about you can divorce someone who are yet to have their periods. For you to divorce, with, divorce someone who yet to have her period, the girls who know what I'm talking about, I'm sure some of the sure. brothers know what I'm talking about. For you to divorce that child, person needs to be married. In the Islamic marriage, marriage is marriage because of the sex. So you have sex with a child, you divorce her, and that is child marriage. It is in the Quran, you divorce them, and then you give them waiting periods, or not waiting periods. Chapter is named as a uh, divorce, Surah 65. So it is not simply forbidden in the Quran. Even though I strongly disagree that the interpretation of the age regarding the Aisha was very different at the time of Muslims, at the time of Muhammad and in early Muslims, I would still state that, yes, Aisha was a child. Because my brother already gave you Sahih Hadith, which identifies Aisha was playing with the dolls, dolls which talks about Aisha, actually there are the hadith talks about Aisha didn't even know how to get home. When they went to war, she was left behind. That is the famous story where she is accusing Sunnis that Aisha did fornication. That, that's the reason, because Aisha was left behind. She, wa she couldn't get home. The question was what Aisha did with the gentleman who saw her. Aisha was a child. She didn't know, she, didn't, she was playing in the swings. Aisha was a child because she had yet to have her period before Muhammad married her in a sexual sense. So even though you, you can make a statement that maybe they got the number wrong, it's not seven but 17, then we will be questioning how come 17 years old person doesn't know how to go home, does, it, does play on the swings, <coughs> play with the dolls. I think those are the good questions and waiting for her period to come to be wife for the Muhammad. And today, Sahih Muslim contains over 1,000 narrations from Aisha, who is identified as the mother of believers, but my understanding is Muslim is asking, how can we trust her testimony, how can she remember what she did when she was six years old? Then we have to ask the same question over thousand hadiths in just Sahih Bukhari. 
Um, there was a comment on Muslim, um, no one ever critiqued age of Aisha until 1900s. You know what is the reason for that? Because it was late 19th, Islamic tradition start being translated to English where we had access. I am from Turkey. I lived in Turkey for long enough. I have not seen how they translated in Turkey, in Turkish, in, Tur in Turkish, in Turkey. Same in Western countries. They even start translating in nine, after 1990s. So when I have access to the book, when I read it, I ask basic questions. I ask questions not because as a Christian I believe it is wrong. It is wrong when gentleman over there thinks it's all right for him to give his daughter to 54 years old man when he put his hand up. But I am more concerned that it has been done by Muhammad, whom according to Surah 33, is the best example to mankind and perfect pattern to follow. And Quran comes and confirms that in Surah 65. That is the issue. There was a comment on <coughs> uh, Mary and her age as 12. I am, not <coughs> I am not here to defend any information which is not in the Bible. Bible doesn't tell me Mary is 12. Sake of the argument, <coughs> if Bible does tell me, Mary is not example for humanity to follow. Joseph is not example for humanity to follow. But Muhammad is example for mankind to follow. That's the argument false. I was very disappointed to hear uh, Islamic inter Muslim interpretation, not Islamic, Muslim interpretation of the Christian God. Even Muslims and Christians agreed we believe in one God. But today I was extra disappointed here that Muslim thinks Christians believe God is one entity with three qualities. That's not what my scripture teaches. My brother, I think, explained very well. Christian scripture teaches there is only one God. And God doesn't make joke about it. He is very serious when he says there is only one God. And this one God is identified as three persons. God the Father is identified as God. God the Son as a person identified as God, whom also identified as the Word of God, took up human nature, came and dwelled among us, and God the Spirit identified as God. They are not three entities. Please, uh, I know Quran doesn't understand the concept of what I believe when it comes to God. Allah thinks I believe in three gods. Allah thinks I believe in Allah, Mary, and Jesus. That's not what my Christian scripture teaches. And that's not, even my brother explained, and clearly, that's not today Muslims believe. Um, there was a comment on Quran is the eternal word of Allah, but it signifies the word of God. Apparently, according to Islamic tradition, um, I did check some of your YouTube videos, sir, and you believe that Quran is the eternal word of God. Eternal word of God take up book nature, comes and then tells humanity the will of Allah. It doesn't tell people about who Allah is, but it tells people about the will of Allah. And eternal word of Allah is very important, apparently, because it is the right recitation of the eternal word of Allah is going to intercede for people on the day of judgment. It is the eternal word of Allah, which the right recitation of the surah is going to appear and give account for you on the day of judgment. Jesus, on the um, question, comments on the Trinity, Jesus, you said Jesus being quality of God, no. Jesus is the eternal word of God. Jesus is the king of kings, lord of lords, who took up human nature, ca came and dwelled among us. Jesus Christ is person in Godhead. 
Okay, that's very, very simple. I am very disappointed to hear, actually, very uh, argument which kind of identified Jesus as an entity in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Also, I, I just didn't understand why this passage came up, because Quran, which Muslims put their trust and eternity on it, confirms the story of Samuel, where God is judging people because of their sins. And every living being, even the donkeys. And Muslims shouldn't be surprised for that, because same thing happened in the teachings of Islam, same thing still happens, and apparently, just side information for you, sir, Amalekites are very, very similar to ISIS. I don't know where you stand on the place of ISIS, but God is just dis um, destroying them. <laughs> there was a question on the, uh, where is the gospel of Jesus in Aramaic? I'm not sure why this question comes because Quran doesn't even tell me Jesus spoke in Aramaic and then he left the gospel in Aramaic. Quran doesn't tell me that. And the gospels I have, which is the earliest historical writings regarding the biography of Jesus, are actually written Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic, he spoke Hebrew, and he spoke Greek. But his disciples, people whom shared life with him, choose to write the Gospels in Greek. And if there is a Gospel in Aramaic, I would love Allah to express that in the Quran, because Allah doesn't say that. And the Gospel, which, and the Torah, which Quran is talking about, is in the possession of the Christians and Jews at the time of Muhammad. And I look at the earliest manuscripts today, I've got 5,852 or 56, I'm not sure exactly the number, Greek manuscripts. And when I look at the Matthew, I see it is Gospels of Jesus are written, biography of Jesus are written in Greek. We do have translations, lots of lots of, please do check them out. So I would, ex I would love to get the reference for that. I also heard that biblical scholars acknowledge that Gospel of John is not written by, um, written by John. I would love to get some references for that. I think it is helpful for us to remember when we pick and choose the scholars. As a Muslim, your most important scholar is Muhammad. After Muhammad, it is Bukhari and then Hadith would follow, <laughs> okay? Your most important scholar is Muhammad. Whom, according to you, delivers the message of Allah to you through an angel? And of course, you wouldn't be surprised that when we look at the Quran, Quran does confirm the disciples of Jesus, whom Muslims had a problem with Paul, but Quran doesn't have so far problem with that. And when we look at the Islamic teachings, here I have the biography of Muhammad with me. I don't know where you stand in the biography of Muhammad, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, one of the earliest biography of Muhammad you ever had, is pretty much fall in love with John and Paul and confirms, you can check it in the time of question and answer, it confirms John wrote down biography of Jesus. So there is no problem for Muslims to accept John Gospel, because Muhammad and early Muslims were okay with it. I am disappointed that 21st century scholars are not happy with their Islamic teachings. Just in three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> we, talk, we talked about the, on the canonization of the Bible, uh, sorry, on the canonization of the Quran. I would love to remind you all as a Muslim uh, Quran has been actually officialized in 1924. <laughs> we are not talking about the Quran, which Muhammad didn't write it down. I'm not talking about the Quran, which is burned under the Abu Bakr. I'm not talking about the Quran, which got lost, eaten by sheep, or uh, forgotten. 
I'm talking about this Quran, officialized in 1924 in Cairo University. 1984, I'm talking about the Arabic, 1984, it has been officialized for the whole world. You wouldn't be surprised. Today in my possessions, I have 37 different Arabic Qurans with over 90,000 textual variations. And when it comes to the canonization of the Quran, Ubay bin Kaab, Ibn Masud, I'm sure Muslim scholars are well known, those people, they were disagreeing regarding which surahs needs to be in the Quran. Did you know there was a time and place? 116 chapters were in the Quran. Did you know there was a time and place? There was only 111 chapters of the Quran, but in somehow you end up having 114 chapters of the Quran with lots of missing verses. I would love to get a historical reference on the Mus Mus Musaf in Tashkent to be the Quran of Uthman. I am afraid to tell you, none of the Muslim scholars will back you up because that is 8th century or 9th century Quran, even though on the top of it, it says this is the Quran from Uthman. That is simply not true because Uthman by that time was dead. And then I will take um, other four pages in my next rebuttal. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It seems uh, aside from this marriage of Aisha, there's, there's no real arguments you have. You, firstly, you misquoted the Quran. Chapter Surah Al-Talaq, by the way, I memorized the entire Quran. The Surah Al-Talaq mentions the women that do not have the period is referring to women who are past the age of menopause. And there are some women who do not even have the menses, meaning they are, biologically it's possible for a woman not to have menses also. It does not mention children. It does not mention children. So why are you clearly misquoting the Quran? It doesn't mention the word sabiya. It doesn't mention the word sagira. It, it doesn't mention any of these words. Use the Arabic, check the Arabic. Unlike the, the Christians, we, you said Jesus spoke Greek. There is no proof for this. He lived in a Hellenistic period, but the, the Aramaic language is spoke, uh, spoken in Syria to this day, the Aramaic language. He spoke Aramaic. In fact, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which is quoted, this is the original tongue. And he's calling out to God, Eloi, Eloi, why is God calling to God? And why does he say, God, you have forsaken me on the cross? Why does God say to God, you have, you have forsaken me if they are one entity? Why is God going in the garden of Gethsemane and prostrating and then saying, uh, remove this cup from me, meaning this trial that I am going through? Additional to that, you mentioned uh, Al Imam al Bukhari as being the second authority of Islam. That is false. Al Imam al Bukhari came uh, at, at least 200 years after the Holy Prophet. He compiled a book which gathered earlier traditions into a book. He was one of the many compilers of hadith. You said, why are Muslims rejecting a hadith now? Read the commentaries on Sahih al-Bukhari, Umdat al-Qari and earlier commentaries. They have criticism of the text. Like Christian scholars who took uh, the verses from Mark out, they have criticism of the Bible. Scholars have criticism of Bukhari and other texts. You'll find that in Fatul al-Bari and Umdat al-Qari and all these books, it's a common thing from over 800 years ago. Likewise, you mentioned uh, Aisha was lost. You didn't mention to them what happened. She was lost in the desert. Anyone who's been to, uh, to Arabian Peninsula, by the way, you referred to Saudi as Saudi a thousand years ago. It wasn't known as Saudi. It became known as Saudi recently. Uh, she was lost in the desert. In the, anyone who's been lost in the desert would need a guide. Even the Prophet himself needed a guide to take him from Mecca to Medina in the migration. So she was a young woman lost in the desert and she was lost not because she was a child, she was lost because generally anyone who becomes lost in the desert needs a guide who can guide them through the pathways because they didn't have the M6 in those days. Likewise, you mentioned the, uh, after the 1900s, they got to know about this. I'm sorry, we lived under, uh, I am from Kashmir in the Himalayan mountains. 
The British ruled us from the late 1700s. We dealt with the British. My grandfather was in the British army. They knew our, check, they got translations of books like Hidayah from the early 1800s. They, they didn't colonize Turkey, that's why you're unfamiliar. But they the, Turkey wasn't colonized. India was colonized and the works of Islam were translated in the 1800s. So why didn't they criticize? Because the age of consent changed internationally by the UN and others, the, the age of consent changed over time. The only reason why you're pressing on the point of Aisha is because you cannot critique the belief in one God. You cannot critique, like Jesus himself, he believed in one God. Like the, the reason to be a Muslim is because we do not believe in a myth. We do not believe in a demigod. We do not believe in a Hellenistic Greek or Roman myth. We believe in the creed of Jesus himself, who said Jesus in John, you read in John, um, that Jesus says in John 20, 17, Jesus said to her, do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Meaning, he was, God is referring to another God as his God and your God makes no sense. You confuse some of the things regarding entity. If you talk to real Christian theologians, like uh, trained theologians, they will tell you that the, uh, the entity of God is one, uh, is, has, is one substance but has three forms. That's what they say, meaning trained theologians, not polemicists. So some of the other red herrings that you mentioned, the Quran, eternality of the Quran. The eternality of the Quran, the attribute is eternal. God's attribute is eternal. The Quran signifies that eternal. Like if I write the name of God, I say Allah. By the way, Jesus said Eloi. We say Allah, very similar. But you say Allah, Allah signifies, the word Allah signifies to God. Likewise, the, the, the revelation of the Quran is a revelation of the written word that signifies to the divine attribute. Different to saying God came in the form of flesh and God came, uh, or, or the attribute of God descended and the uh, man became divine. That is a pagan concept and that's the main reason. My questions regarding uh, the abolition of the law were not ans answered at all. You didn't encounter any of my points. An additional point, you said sa the story of Samuel is in the Quran. If the Quran orders the murder of women and children, and you can quote that to me, that the Quran says kill the women and children and the oxes and the asses and the donkeys and everything else, you misquoted the Quran for a second time. That is something which is very unscholarly. Additional to that, you said Amalekites are like ISIS. Does that mean you go and kill the women and children of ISIS? Is that what Christians believe? Amalekites, uh, if ISIS are condemned, they're terrorists, you, uh, the terrorists should be trialed in a court of law within accordance with the law of Jesus. But does that mean you go and kill the women and children of ISIS and the animals and everything else that's roaming about in Syria today? So additional to that, you mentioned that the language of Jesus was uh, Aramaic. I said to you, where is the original gospel of Jesus? You said it's the, the Greek gospel and you have copies of the Greek gospel. Jesus never spoke Greek and you can never prove this. Ibn Ishaq, you mentioned uh, oh, before I go into Ibn Ishaq, Trinity in the Quran, you say the Quran misquotes Trinity. Christians themselves had so many sects that they differed. Uh, go and read on all the Ebionites and the, all the other different sects in Christianity. Christians themselves could not even define Trinity. In fact, the Catholics have Mary in the Trinity. You mentioned that uh, uh, the Protestants don't follow, uh, uh, believe Mary is a role model, but Catholics have Mary in the Trinity. So Christians amongst themselves, even to this day, cannot define Trinity. In fact, if you go back to the video, your very definition of uh, Trinity is lost in words that people cannot make any rational sense, meaning what is referred to the hypostatic union, the technical term with regard to the Trinity. You mentioned Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq is just a compilation, an early compilation, uh, what you would refer to like an apocrypha. There's a textual, you know, in the Bible, in Bible scholarship, you have higher criticism, you have uh, criticism of the literature. Why are you not, why are you in, using a cavalier approach with the Islamic books? Meaning, I will not decontextualize any of the verses of the Bible, but you can easily quote an apocryphal text. If I were to bring all the apocryphal Bibles today and all the apocryphal testaments and use that as an evidence against you, that would not carry any weight. Ibn Ishaq's book is open to criticism. Like the, the text of Bukhari is open to criticism. There are texts, like Sahih Muslim has a, a variant of a hadith, uh, Inna abi wa abaka fin nar. The scholars go ahead and criticize the text itself. It's a common thing. They also say if a hadith contradicts the Quran, we go with the Quran, we abandon the hadith. It's a, it's a found in an early manuscript of Islamic 
uh, uh, legal theory, like Usul Shashi, this is a normal Muslim method. You s uh, the additional thing you said uh, uh, regarding 111 chapters in the Quran. Again, this is taken from a, a report of Ibn Mas'ud that there are three commonly recited chapters that we have in the Quran. Every day we recite Surah Al-Fatiha and we also recite two chapters as a, pra a prayer every day. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud didn't add them into his personal copy. He didn't add them. And his student narrates that Abdullah bin Mas'ud didn't place these three chapters in his personal copy. It doesn't mean Abdullah bin Mas'ud is rejecting those chapters. This is again decontextualizing a report just to fit a narrative. Now, additional to that, you mentioned Uthman's Mus'haf. Did you know 100 years ago Uthman's Mus'haf was in the Grand Umayyad Mosque 100 years ago? And during the French occupation, the Grand Umayyad Mosque was burnt down and the Mus'haf was burnt with it. Authentic. This is known in known history. So just from 100 years ago, the in, in Grand Umayyad Mosque, the Mus'haf was there until the masjid was burnt down during a French occupation. This is a very uh, simple thing. So my points remain, but I, I wanted to mention towards the end something uh, with regard to how do you understand the law? Because in, uh, we find, for instance, in Corinthians uh, 14, verses 34 and 35, which applies to women, it says, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays for or prophesies with the head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head is shaved, were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to leave her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. This is, this is in the New Testament. How do you explain also in the New Testament in uh, First Timothy, uh, in, uh, that you find that uh, quote, uh, this second quote is from First Timothy. That quote was from First Corinthians 11.6. Uh, the second quote is from First Timothy 2.11. You find a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. This is not in the Quran. In the Quran, women were allowed to speak. A woman disputed with the Prophet. Surah Al-Mujadila was re revealed. The entire chapter giving a ruling to the woman. A Caliph Umar stood up. A woman objected to him. Women were not barred from speaking. But look what Paul says. This man that you believe is a prophet, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. Tommy Robinson and the like, when they quote the Quran to the media today, they don't quote these things. These are in the New Testament. Not in the Old Testament, but the question still remains. Why did God, who is Jesus according to you, order the killing of women and children? Also, he said in the Old Testament, if a woman intervenes when two men are disputing, her husband is disputing, when she intervenes, her hand should be cut off. Also in Deuteronomy and Genesis, all these different uh, uh, rulings are found which denigrate uh, humanity. And you said, law, I said to you, how do you define good law and bad law? You still have not told me. Does God define good law? Then according to your reasoning, we should abandon the Bible. Uh, likewise, in, uh, we find so many different passages which uh, in the Old Testament, which you say Jesus is God, therefore Jesus legislated all those things. But in the Quran, you are unable to furnish anything of that nature found in the Quran. In fact, you misquoted the Quran regarding the women in men menop uh, menopause or women who do not have a biological haid. So this is uh, very uh, shameful. These questions remain, my questions remain. Is Jesus the God of the Old Testament or a different God? Why did Jesus become the Lamb in the New Testament and the Prince of Peace in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament he was a God of vengeance? Why did he uh, change his character? Likewise, where is the Gospel of Jesus in his own tongue? Uh, I said to you, a canonization of the Quran, if we accept a recension of the Quran was done 18 years after the Prophet, uh, the Quran is memorized. From every decade, children memorize the Quran in its entirety. No one can bring a manuscript. But where is the word of Jesus in the Aramaic language? Likewise, who has the right to abrogate the law? Why did Paul legislate this for women? According to the New Testament, you should not even be speaking. I do not agree with that. I do not agree with that. In Islam, you're permitted to speak. A woman is allowed to dispute with the men. It happened in Islamic history. Aisha, who you mentioned, was one of the main proponents for women in early Islamic history. She even led an army. She even led an army that's well known in Islamic history. Likewise, she taught the men so many different things. But why did Paul do this? Why this uh, blatant contradiction which is found? So, 
Uh, finally, I will move on to, uh, remember you didn't answer 1 John 5, 7. Why in one Bible is it different and why, okay, if someone said the Quran we have today, you said, oh yeah, you mentioned 37 variants of the Quran. That is false information. Those are different. The Rasmul Quran, the orthography is one. The orthography is one. The pronouncement of certain words is, is something which the Quran was revealed in, which is known as the Qira'at. Th that is not a variant. A variant is when there is a total different meaning. Meaning, in one dialect of Arabic, you say, like tomato and tomato. Very Tomato and tomato, Maliki Yawmiddin, Maliki Yawmiddin. That's all it is. That's not a variant. There's no different teachings in the 37 prints you claim to have. That is deception. And Jesus taught against deception. A person should not use deception. Additional to that, you, uh, the, why is John, uh, this first John 5, 7 different in one Bible and different in another Bible? Why is Mark, the verses of Mark, taken out from uh, one Bible and found in another Bible? Uh, please explain that very simple uh, point regarding the last chapter of Mark. In my uh, edition, in this edition, you have, for, is, uh, for instance, you have this passage, and at the bottom they place a footnote. Most early man manuscripts omit Mark 16, 9 to 20, and that's found in the RSV. The RSV, in fact, published an edition, the, uh, the standard version, without those verses. Without those verses. That's not found in the 37 prints of the Qur'an. For you to say, Azhar University commissioned the Qur'an, you heard the people laugh here. They're laughing because these are not ignorant Muslims. Those arguments may wash with someone who's ignorant of Islamic history. The Azhar University just published a Qur'an with the Qira'a, which is a mode of recitation. It's a mode of recitation. One group recites like Wadduha, another group recites Wadduha, just a mode of recitation. Do not use deception like you have used deception regarding the menopause of women and said to the uh, Christian followers or people who are, who are unfamiliar with that ruling that it's children, child marriage in the Quran. How can it be child marriage in the Quran? When child marriage, when Surah An-Nisa, it mentions that when, you, when our young orphans come, do not marry them until they pass the age of puberty. When it mentions that very clearly in the Quran, in the Surah Al-Talaq, the chapter of divorce, is referring to women who have menopause. Because sometimes when a woman passes the age of 50, she has no periods. And when she has no period, what happens is a man divorces her, so they say, how long should she wait? This is the ruling. So you're clearly misquoting the Quran in order to uh, beguile the people and take them away from the true teachings of Jesus. Towards the end, I will demonstrate to you that in fact I am the lover of Jesus and the true follower of Jesus. Uh, I will show you that how uh, uh, toward the end of the last 10 minutes, how I'm the real follower of Jesus. And we will wait for that moment, inshallah. Something to look forward to. Uh, ten minute uh, rebuttal to the Sheikh's rebuttal um, from uh, Can you get the mic? I guess, I guess we already broke the covenant which we made at the beginning. Moderator gave us the rules, respect, and I think you all noticed that I've been called the names, but seems that's okay. Um, I'm not gonna d dwell on that. I just wanted to express that. I've been called deceiver, but that's okay. So, uh, I just read the Quranic verse to you. And then you make your own judgment. Surah 65, verse 4. This is the word of Allah, and this is what Allah simply says. And those who no longer accept menstruation among your women, so that means women who are in their 70s, 60s, 50s, when they are old, if you doubt, then their waiting period is three months. And those who have not menstruated yet. So it is talking about group of women. In the first group, it is talking about old 
females who do not have their periods anymore. In the second group, it is talking about those who are yet to have their periods. According to all tafsirs, Ibn Katir including, Ibn Abbas including, they are identifying these four children because they are in young age, they are not having their periods, so you can divorce them. Just remember, for you to divorce them, you need to marry with them, you need to have sex with them. That shows I did not use deception because I do not worship a God who deceives. So that was simply Quranic verse for you. I read it. We clarified that. Um, I'm not sure why this come up at the end of the conversation regarding the head covering, regarding the head covering and the authority of the woman in the church. Can you please, can you please put your hand up if you are Christian in this room? So, we have 99% of the room is Muslim. I will submit the authority of the church in my preachings when these 99% Muslims got baptized. We have a water here. You can get baptized. You will be my brothers and sisters. We will treat this as a church. Then we will discuss the authority of the woman on the submission, woman's place of submission. But I am very disappointed that, again, Islamic tradition and Islamic hadith actually talks about you do not put woman in authority. I am not sure why Aisha failed to follow that hadith. Um, when it comes to the head covering, I am sorry that you did not hear the rest of the 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because it simply clarifies my hair. Last time when I checked, this was hair, and then I washed it this morning. It is hair, my head covering. If you read it, end of the chapter, a little bit patiently, mm. you will know. And while my hair is my head covering, Head covering co in steps into the Muslim world so that Muslim women will be identified and they do not get abused. Because what happened to the Sauda according to Islamic tradition? But I'm going to go back to the where I left. The reason I didn't respond to your questions because I had only 20 minutes. You gave me five pages comments. And in your opening statement, you did not even reason for us why I should be Christian, why I shouldn't be Christian, and should be Muslim. Therefore, you have to wait as the time comes on. So I'm only in page two. And just a clarification for sake of Muslims, not, sorry, not sake of the sister, Christian sisters and brothers, just sake of the Muslims. It is not true that Tashkent Musaf, Tashkent Quran is from time of Uthman. That is not simply true. You do your homework. Please do not take what people say. What I say, go and check it out. As I'm sure you noticed, I am the one who is in this room, and my brother is the one who is giving reference. Muslim sites have not given any reference, therefore I cannot handle the references they, given, they haven't given. Um, there was a co comment on the recitation and memorization of the Quran. I'm sure which you are already identified as educated Muslims, you know that reason Quran is written down because people who memorized the Quran, they died in the battle. It was only 70 of them. And then Muslim world suddenly, I don't know how to say this word nicely, maybe you translate it, freaked out. They got Freak conscious, out. they got like, conscious, they are losing the Quran, therefore they wrote it down. And as they write it down, if you believe that you memorize the Quran very well, I would really, really appreciate a couple of people to stand up in this room, especially the, those one who memorize the Quran very well. Recite for me adult breast suckling verses. Recite for me Surah 33, verse 127. And <coughs> recite for me the Rajam verses. If you memorized it, those verses was in the Quran of Uthman, Abu Uthman and Abu Bakr, they are not in today's Quran. If you memorized it, I would love to hear the recitation of that. I would love to get reference. 
regarding what is the reference that actually Matthew copied from Mark. That, that command was made, but there is no reference. If you travel today around the world, yes, there are children from age five learn to memorize the Quran and recite the Quran. I think that is very amazing. But you know what? They recite different Qurans. <laughs> I'm sorry that you don't believe what is the physical evidence. You can check them out, and I'm sure you would, you would know English is not my first language, Arabic is not my first language, but in English and in Arabic, fight and kill are two different words. And in the Quran, you can see these variations. That's just one example. Um, uh, there was reference asked regarding Jesus speak Greek or not, he didn't speak Greek, but actually reference I was given regarding Jesus is calling woman dog. That is actually very awesome passage confirms how Jesus, there is no any other way, how Jesus got himself. And in that passage, Jesus is engaging with Greek woman. For Jesus to engage with Greek woman, probably Jesus was practicing his Greek. Um, story of Lot, story of, so, and also, as Jesus called this woman dog, that wasn't insult. There is a, there is a man in Old Testament, there is a man in Old Testament identified as Caleb, in Hebrew definition for that name is dog, and he's identified as the one who followed God with all of his heart. It is amazing compliment given to the those who are not belong to the Israelites. Lot and his example with uh, he slept with his daughters. Lot is not prophet in Christian faith; it is prophet in Islamic faith, and people does sinful things, which Lot did. Jacob was, you said it's Jacob, but actually, please do check that, that's Judah. He was deceived and slept with his uh, daughter-in-law, and he was simply deceived. Simple people did simple things, and Bible records that. I don't have that much time to respond to all those objections, but I am happy to, if anyone brings them in the question and answer, I can respond them. Let me tell you something. King of kings, Lord of universe, Logic of cosmos not only stepped into this world, but he stepped in this <coughs> world, gave his life for humanity on the cross, and turns that humanity and says, would you like to spend your eternity with me? In that cross, Lord Jesus Christ, ask people to make marriage covenant with him. Wherever you stand today, Lord Jesus Christ is the one, he can only give you eternal life. Wherever you stand today, you know if you've got Islamic Jesus, you will never get that eternal life. Now the final um, statement, um, rebuttal. Uh, will be Sheikh Asrars, and after that we'll be opening the floor um, for questions. Firstly, to start with the verse of the Quran, uh, I've got the Quran here open in front of me in the original Arabic tongue, unlike the New Testament, which we do not know the, uh, the New Testament in the Gospel of Jesus in his original tongue. The Quran here states the verse it, it mentions uh, regarding the women. The first one is regarding the women uh, in Haid. The sec it mentions in Irtabtum, if you're doubtful, فَعِدَّتُهُنَّ ثَلَاثَةُ أَشْهُرٍ The women, and the second one which is mentioned, وَاللَّائِي لَمْ يَحِدْنَا Those women who ha do not have the haid, which is the women in menopause. The third category, وَأُولَاتُ الْأَحْمَالِ The women who are pregnant. The women who are pregnant. This is the third one. Please quote the Quran correctly. 
Do not denigrate the Christian faith by misquoting the Quran in order to just to win a polemical debate. Secondly, it's the point you mentioned, again another misquote, that 70 people who had memorized the Quran, they died. No. Thousands of companions had memorized the Quran. A war occurred in which 70 memorizers of the Quran died. Not all the memorizers of the Quran. And Abu Bakr, uh, Umar radiallahu anh, came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, and he said there is an urgency because 70 memorizers of the Quran have died. Abu Bakr himself memorized the Quran. Umar memorized the Quran. Multiple companions had already memorized the Quran. Do not nitpick in order to make a false argument. Secondly, you said stoning in the Quran was in the manuscript of Uthman. That is incorrect. You cannot ever source that. What Umar said was that the verse of the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet, the stoning was recited, but then it was not added into the recension of Uthman. It was not added into the recension of Uthman because the ruling, the ruling remained, but the recitation was abrogated. At least quote it correctly. Meaning, if you're going to make an argument against that, at least quote the context correctly. Additional to that, he said children recite different Quran. This is false, that's why everyone laughed. Because we listen to kids reciting the Quran in, Sa in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Syria, I studied in Syria, I've been to Egypt, I've been to Morocco, I've been over to over 15 different countries. Now we live in the modern age. Type in on YouTube the different types of Qurans, they're not different Qurans. They may have a different mode of recitation. This is another misquote you keep using, which is taking it totally out of context. It's just, it's like uh, tomato and tomato, as I mentioned the example earlier. You mentioned Lot and Judah and the lineage. I said, even if Judah sinned, the lineage of Jesus is tainted then. Because according to the New Testament, there is a illegitimate child in the lineage of Jesus. How can you believe there's an impurity in the lineage of God? I mean, firstly, God doesn't even have a lineage. But if you ascribe a lineage to God, how can you even believe there's an illegitimate, when in the Old Testament it states that an illegitimate child shall not even enter the, the, uh, the places of worship. There are verses that say that in the Old Testament. And the additional questions were not answered, meaning I'm attempting to answer all your points. Was Jesus cursed? You never answered that. According to the old, how ca we cannot become Christians because the New Testament is telling us that Jesus was cursed. We cannot become Christians. In fact, atheism is more of a rational choice than Christianity. That's why majority of Christians turn to atheism. There's, there's no rationality in Christianity. Now, I've said to you, I will prove that I am the real follower of Christ. But before going on to that, there are two challenges. One is in the Quran, the Prophet challenged them to a mutual cursing. That the Muslims will say, the curse of God be upon us if we lie. And the Christians are challenged to say, may the, God, uh, may the curse of God be upon them if they lie. I'm sure you will accept the Quranic challenge. That I will say openly now, if I am a liar and I am false, may God curse me. You are challenged to accept uh, to do the same. That is the challenge from the Quran. But then you have a challenge also from Mark. The verses that were taken out by Jesus, ascribed to Jesus himself, where Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized, you wanted everyone to be baptized here, so you're baptized, will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned, so you're baptized, and this is what you should be able to do. And these signs will accompany those who believe, these signs should accompany you. In my name they will drive out demons. I'm sure there's no one possessed by a devil here, but nevertheless, they will speak in new tongues. So you said you cannot speak English well, but you should speak in tongues. You should be able to eloquently put your argument across according, I meaning speaking in tongues. The apostles were able to speak in any language to the people that they conveyed the message to. Additional, they will pick up snakes with their hands. They will pick up snakes. I do not have a deadly snake, but I have the next thing. And when they drink deadly poison, so I brought poison with me. When they bring deadly, when they drink <laughs> deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. Here, rat poison. Look, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people. Ali, stand up. There is a brother here, Ali, who is who is blind. He is blind. He has volunteered for this. He's a sick, and they will get well. So we have a challenge. Jesus has told us who his true followers are. If they are baptized, today's Christians, 200 denominations, even if we abandon Islam, meaning for a secular world order, because really people hate on Islam because of Sharia law. Uh, they can never debate the concept of God in Islam. 
They always debate Sharia because the Sharia law is the only law that's opposing the UN and all the secular world, or Anglo world order. But if we, placing that aside, if we abandon Islam and we have two choices, atheism and we have, which is more rational than Christianity. The second one is Christianity, 200 denominations. You tell us Catholics are wrong. Protestants within themselves, you have Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, you have Jehovah's Witnesses, so many sects to choose from. Jesus has told us that the true Christians can drink poison. They can cure people like Ali. Are you able to fulfill that challenge? Are you able to drink rat uh, poison? The rat poison is here for anyone to come and drink the rat poison. And if they cannot, well, it's a safety cap on here. I'll leave this. They, they should be able to drink rat poison and cure Ali, and those will be the true followers of Jesus. So this final thing, that with regard to the challenge of the Qur'an, meaning after we discussed, you said, why turn Muslim? Firstly, any of the laws you find in the Qur'an, mainly most people leave Islam because of the laws. Like Paul wanted to abandon the laws, there are Christians today who want to abandon the laws, meaning restriction, you can't eat hamburg hamburgers from McDonald's, you cannot eat pig, you cannot drink alcohol, too many restrictions. Uh, the woman is commanded by God to cover and the man is ordered to keep his gaze low. These are laws which people find strict. So they abandon the law. Now when they, uh, they, you want us to abandon the law, but the law itself, Jesus came to fulfill the law. Uh, if we didn't have dietary restrictions, you could be like the people in China eating snakes and reptiles and everything and anything. Dietary restrictions are there, so a person learns self-restraint. We fast in the month of Ramadan, so we learn self-restraint. The law is there for a reason. But then you criticize the law and the character of the Prophet. But I'm saying to you, if you criticize the Islamic law, your own books, Jesus says, bring my enemies forth and kill them. You've not answered that. The New Testament says Jesus is cursed. In fact, there's a portion in which the Bible says Jesus even went to hell. Meaning, it states that, meaning Paul writes this, that Jesus went to hell after being crucified. He, he died according to them. And then there's a contradiction. Jesus is calling out to himself. So he says, oh God, why have you forsaken me? But you're telling us he's God. So God is calling out to himself and saying, why have you forsaken me? You've given no explanation for that. Likewise, he is calling out to himself by saying, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani. Likewise, the God of the Old Testament is ordering the killing of women and children. And you have still not, and you said it's in the Quran, but it's not in the Quran. Uh, you, you have not been able to produce that story of Samuel from the Quran, where the Quran orders the killing of women and children. In fact, in the Hadith, it's so mass transmitted from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that you cannot kill women and children. It even tells you you cannot kill old people. It even tells you you cannot kill the, the monks and the Christians. They're protected. Even the trees cannot be cut down. Christians never quote that in the Hadith. There's a, uh, there's a conduct of war in Islamic law. And if there's isolated reports that contradict that, the scholars will have a critique of those hadiths. That's why you rushed off to quoting hadith, and even the Quran you misquoted. You misquoted the Quran because that verse I just mentioned to you, verse 4, it does not say what you say. You're relying on translations because you are used to using translations for the, the Bible. So this Bible, uh, tr made, uh, they translated the Bible, the the language of Jesus from Aramaic to Greek and from Greek to Latin. And even in Latin, they hid that from the people in the, Europe, in the Middle Ages, from the, in the Dark Ages. But in Islam, the Quran was never hidden. The, the child had memorized the Quran. In Islamic history, the Quran was never hidden. Everyone recited the Quran. In Christianity, now we can read the Bible and we can check that there is violence in the New Testament also. Okay, My we're time gonna, is finished. We're leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, That completes the statements from our speakers. Uh, we've heard lots. It's been controversial um, and passionate. The floor is now open uh, for questions. Please raise your hands. Please don't shout your questions. We have microphones, uh, and they will be brought to you um, for those who have a question. I will try to. Um, we will try to uh, ask a question uh, to each speaker. You have one question. Please don't make it into a speech. We want to try to get through uh, as much as we can. Um, so there's, uh, let's take the question there first of all. And then the next question is there in the middle, Hamza.
Thank you very much for your question. Three minutes. Um, with regard to your question, firstly, salvation is through Jesus Christ. We as Muslims accept this. It means teachings of Jesus Christ. Likewise, salvation is through the Prophet Muhammad, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them both. But what we d uh, refuse to accept is divinity of Christ, that Jesus worshipped one true God. We believe that the sins are forgiven by that one true God. Now, you're saying past sins, how can they be forgiven? God does not need a blood sacrifice for the sins to be forgiven. Even in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj, when Allah mentions the sacrifice given in the Hajj, He says that the sacrifice, the blood and the meat doesn't reach God, but the trueness of heart. If you have a true heart, you are in the kingdom of God. You are forgiven by God. By acknowledging Jesus Christ and acknowledging the Prophet Muhammad, Peace be upon them both as messengers of God and not as gods themselves, not as divine. That passage I mentioned to you, God, uh, Jesus says the same. That is the true teaching of Jesus, that Jesus took people to God. But then what happened? The teachings of Jesus were distorted by Paul. How were they distorted by Paul? Paul is responsible for what we know as the New Testament today. The New Testament is, was <coughs> works written and compiled. Uh, what was questioned is how do, uh, what reference is there that the, uh, the book of John, the book of John, go and check scholarly uh, in Protestant commentaries on the Bible. They acknowledge the fact that the book of John is not by the Apostle John. It was written decades after Jesus. Decades after Jesus, the New Testament was written and it was written in a Hellenistic Greek environment making Jesus into a demigod. When they made Jesus into a demigod, Allah sent the final prophet to clarify this issue. Christians today cannot refute us on that. So they resort to tarnishing the character of the holy prophet. So they bring up the marriage of Aisha or the wars and these type of things. But when we study the Quran correctly and we understand that there may be some apocryphal hadith, that the narrators may state something incorrectly, we, we interpret those hadith or we reject some of those hadith. But, but I said this is a contradiction. Why? Because the Old Testament contains worse things. It contains killing of babies. You notice they are saying God sanctioned the killing of babies. We are not saying God sanctioned the killing of babies. The Old Testament is saying this. So by that reasoning, we should reject the Old Testament. Christians should reject the Old Testament. So salvation of your sins... Remember, God doesn't need blood sacrifice. All we believe is when you succumb to your human nature, you turn to God and you make a resolve and God forgives your sins. Thank you. We had a question there in the middle. Do we still have a question? Yeah, yeah just wait, wait for the microphone. For the others. Sure. Yeah. So when we believe that um, when Jesus, obviously we believe that there are three persons within the one divine being, and I think I gave a good explanation of that. So Jesus is speaking to the Father. Now, when Jesus became a man, he, he also became a servant of God in order to be the perfect man and, be the, and take our place on the cross, because if he had to have his own sins to pay for, then he couldn't take our place. So Jesus is speaking to the Father in that particular situation. But I just want to respond quickly to a couple of things that Azra said. 
Um, remember the hadith I said about sins being like a fly on your nose? This, if you believe Allah can just forgive you, if God can just forgive you, you're looking at your sin as just a fly on your nose. We believe that sin is like a big mountain about to crush you. So we look to Christ. Now see, if God is just, if God is truly just, he must punish us for our sins. To be merciful is to not give you justice. We look at Christ, we look at Jesus as though he willfully came in and took our place for us. And in regards to the last chapter of Mark, we don't, not all Christians accept that last chapter. The reason why is it's because it's not in the earliest manuscripts. That's exactly what Azra said. It is not in the earliest manuscripts. Um, is that, does that satisfy your question in regards to the why Jesus, he was speaking to the Father? Does that answer your question? Yeah, how much time we got left? Yeah. You want to say something? Um, I would just add what my brother said. Um, in Christian scripture, it makes sense because we believe in triune God. God the Son and God the Father do not act independently. They go like teenage child who does the, her own thing. Uh, they work together. I guess my question would be to you. In Surah 33, verse 56, Allah does salat for Muhammad. Who does Allah do salat? Allah is one being monad. Who is the one who hears the salat of Allah? I think those are the questions in your free time. It will be helpful for you to think through. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Amaj, I've just got 37 yeah, seconds. Go on, give you 30 seconds. So just in regard to Jesus becoming a curse for us, this is basically what Paul is trying to say is Jesus took the curse of the law for us. The curse that we couldn't bear, Jesus took that for us. That's all Paul is trying to say. Now, Jesus obeyed the law perfectly. And when it says cursed is everyone who relies on the law, it's talking about people who rely on the law for salvation. So it doesn't actually apply to Jesus. Right, thank you. We've only got seven seconds to spare. Uh, we're going to take a question there. I'm just going to clarify... Um, the, the speakers have three minutes to answer each question. In that time, if they want to rebut something that a previous speaker has said, they are allowed to do that. So I know some people were a bit concerned about Caleb going off topic there from the question, but the speakers are allowed to do that uh, because that's their, their three minutes. It's for the audience to decide whether you think the answer was satisfactory or not. We'll take the question there. Okay, thank you very much for Now, why we we wait as we study against Aristotle? Uh, we need to go back to the book of Christ. I know as a Christian, we written the Bible to be written hundred years after the book of Christ. And uh, do you have a question, sir? No, yes. The Quran. It says we need to go back to the basics. We need to go to the Quran. And most of you, the Muslim, you're talking about the Hadith. The Hadith is Bukhari. He is in God, in God Arab. In 16 years, he collected 600, 600,000. Yes? And uh, you end up at 7,000. So there are too many talk about the Hadith. The Quran itself, if you talk, go study the Quran, you will see, you will find the reality. Okay, your so question, the, sir. So, so you're talking about the hadith. Now, uh, a news now, today, and tomorrow will be different, and different places. So the hadith is not respect. What is your question, sir? Your question. My question, all the religions depended, Christian and Muslim depended on the hadith. Not on the okay, I'll answer your question. Firstly, if you notice in our discussion, I pointed out to my interlocutors that they should not be citing hadith first. They should be going to the Quran. So you acknowledge my point. Additionally, the Quran was misquoted again. You said Yusalluna ala Nabi is that God uh, is uh, praying to Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, or praying for. 
Firstly, the word yusalloon, if you know Arabic, meaning you should speak in tongues because Jesus said the true followers should speak in tongues, is a homonym. It's a homonym. It has multiple meanings. This is common in the Quran. You have one, with a, one word when applied to distinct individuals carries different meanings. If you don't understand Arabic, then at least refer to Lane's lexicon. Go on Google and write in Google Lane's lexicon and check the word yusalloon. For instance, the word yusalloon can come, it's from the root yusala yusli, which means to burn, burn something. So you can, you, a person like you would end up translating is, God is burning the Prophet, mistranslation. It's a homonym word. Unfortunately, you are unable to do that with your Bible because you do not even know Greek. You do not even know Latin. You do not even know Aramaic, which many Muslims know. You do not even know Hebrew. You cannot even resort back to your original texts. We can resort back to our original text. With regard to Caleb's point on sins, the hadith means when a Muslim has a small sin uh, and he deems it like a fly on his nose or a mountain, this is referring to repentance. A Muslim sins, he sees a mountain of sins and he repents and turns to God straight away. This is the meaning. It doesn't mean that uh, we, uh, we take the sins lightly. It means when we do a sin, we turn to God straight away because of our human nature. Uh, additional to that, there was a point uh, which aside from uh, sinning uh, with regard to God, I mean Jesus, calling out to... So God, God came in the form of a human being and when he came in the form of a human being, he called upon himself. This is what we are being told. So God came in the form of a human being and he called out to himself and he said to himself why have you forsaken me he said why have you forsaken me meaning who is calling out to who this is the the illogical aspect of christianity which why much of the western world has abandoned christianity because it has no root in a rational basis our discussion originally should start from natural theology natural theology is the recourse of the mind to reasoning our faith first before starting from scripture if we started from reasoning alone our islamic creed of god which you have not critiqued you only pulled out this yusalluna point which is a homonym and i'm still waiting for you to drink this rat tox because <laughs> jesus when jesus said that meaning if if you uh, fulfill those miracles of healing ali and then every, the debate will be finished will say they are true disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. We've got a question on this side. There's one in the middle here. In order to uh, relieve myself of my sins, your, your Christian belief is that I have to go through Jesus uh, in order to do that, and that originates from the original sin of Adam, who ate the forbidden apple, and therefore it, the entire mankind is punished for that. So, number one, why am I being punished for someone else's sin? Um, second of all, um, if I commit a sin, why does it require someone to, um, uh, to be punished for that. So the example I would give you is if I commit murder and I have a twin brother who loves me so much that he is willing to take that punishment on himself, would a God be just to punish my, uh, my brother as opposed to myself? I think we've got that question now. Thank you. Um, so in regards to the first question, sorry, what was the, what was the first question again? Just remind me. Salvation through Jesus. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, this is not just... I'm this yeah, yeah, okay. So you are not being punished for Adam's sin. That was the first question that you asked, right? You do not stand before God because of Adam's sin. I do not stand before God because of Adam's sin. I stand before God before my own sin, uh, for my own sin, right? Secondly, there's only two ways that it can go in terms of justice. Either you can pay the price for your sin which the Bible says is an eternity in hell, or 
somebody else who is righteous and who has not sinned can offer themselves to take your place. Now, in our culture, we don't find that acceptable. But in ancient cultures, it was actually considered quite noble to come forward and offer to take somebody else's place. So just because we don't accept it in these days or today's modern culture doesn't accept it doesn't mean that it's not right. It, I think it's a noble thing that somebody can come forward and willfully take your place on the cross. Did you want to say something about, about this? Yeah. Sorry, can I, can I just follow up, follow up with the question? Um, your second argument is false because that's not Christian scripture teaches. Your brother is sinful person. Your twin brother is sinful person like you. Only difference is he failed to kill the people you killed. That's the only difference. But that doesn't mean your twin brother is very good and righteous person. In the story of Christian scripture, it is perfect God man steps into the world. It is not my brother who is sinful. It is not my mother who loves me. He, she wants to take my place. It is God looks at us and he says, no, they can't do it. I love them. I want them, but they can't do it. His son is willing to give his life for people like you and like me. And that is, he is not under any obligation. He does that out of his grace. And I am grateful that when I stand in front of Holy God, all I am saying is, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. You thought I was worthy enough that you laid your life down, your life down for me. How many? Just in regards to the poison, quickly. Yeah, I was going to respond to that. Sorry, just in regards to the poison, um, as I said, that that isn't in the earliest manuscript, so the poison it doesn't uh, work. And also in regards to... But even if it was I, in the I, earliest I, manuscripts... Sorry, you can respond. Um, I would love to know. I've, I would love to know, actually, if you can drink that poison. Because remember, guys, what Mohammed says? Just drink the poison, get a date. It should help you. Yeah, that's right, says that. <laughs> okay. Date? Can someone go and get a date? And also, can someone check if it is poison or not? So, so. Right. So, of course, someone needs to question if that is poison or some deception is going there or not. We can check that. We'll get that checked in the labs shortly. Question down here. Uh, and then we're going to, we're rapidly moving to close now. I, I can see a few more hands. We'll try to get through as many as we can. I'm going to limit the, I'm going to limit the responses to two minutes now because we want to finish just around nine o'clock. Got a question here. Okay. Um, with regard to what Caleb said, that uh, it was an honor for people to die for the sake of someone else in previous cultures and it's no longer honorable, then that would mean you should accept the marriage of Aisha Radiallahu because it was a cultural accepted fact, fact at that time and it's not accepted anymore. Additional to that, uh, you mentioned uh, a few more points, but I cannot remember that maybe the poison is taking its effect. <laughs> I said that I, do you see, it's a matter of faith. This is a matter of faith, yeah? Uh, ba ba uh, basically, um, we had Ali there for you to cure and poison to drink. Now you said that you do not believe those verses are a part of the Bible, yes? So you're telling us to believe in a Bible which has verses that you yourself do not believe in. Meaning, what, what kind of religion is this that some, one group of people are saying these are verses from God and another group of Christians are saying that these are not verses from God? This is a, a, a contradiction. So, so the Quran says, do you believe in some of the book and reject some of the book? So this is a big problem for Muslims because we accept all the Quran from beginning to end. But you have just acknowledged that this uh, aspect is not from the Bible. So to conclude... 
The reason why a person should be a Muslim is because in Islam we have true belief in a monotheistic transcendent God and uh, which is a perfect uh, absolute being and if anyone believes in a human being, a man god, a demigod, they are in fact falling into paganism and away from the true, true religion of God. Okay, next question, thank you. Sin is transgression of God's law. That's uh, a simple way to answer it. So, sorry, say that again. I can't quite understand what he's saying. Is it okay, is it okay to kill donkeys and babies? Okay. I think, in, yeah, in that passage, it's a good one to answer to quickly. Um, in that passage, that there is a, a similar argument in the Quran where uh, somebody who Moses is following and learning from uh, kills a child, and it's Surah 18. And the, it was something, and the prophet responded to Moses and said that um, the reason why he killed him was because he was going to cause his parents pain. Now, the reason why God ordered the killing of the Amalekites was because they were going to, number one, persecute Israel and try to destroy them. In fact, one of them survived, which was um, Haman, and he tried to kill all the Jews in Babylon. And um, in addition to that, uh, they were going to try and lead them away from the religion. So God, because he knew that, in the same way in your Quran has a story where somebody is killed, a boy is killed because he was going to cause his parents grief, in the same way, this is much more serious. God knew that the Amalekites and the Canaanites were going to lead Israel away from the worship of God, and they knew, he knew that they were going to try and destroy them, so he ordered them all killed. And also remember, it is the similar story in Christian faith and in Islam, the flood of Noah. In the flood of Noah, lots of beings, human beings, animal beings were there. I am just going to give quick response to the Tawhid because I didn't get a chance to respond. Um, Islam, I'm sorry to tell you that, but Islam doesn't teach monotheism. Islam doesn't teach Tawhid. Tawhid is unification. Islam teaches Allah does pray to someone for Muhammad. It is in Arabic and even in the Hadith, you can, you can, you can know, you can know what Allah prays. Allah prays for self-confident. If Islam teaches Tawhid, Maybe you'll have a chance next time. Uh, there's a question here. Great question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, the, the word begotten there is actually, it can mean just unique. So Jesus is God's unique son. Now, how can uh, God, Jesus be both God and the son of God? That's the real question. So if we were to say someone was the son of Satan, we would say that would be an evil, ungodly person, right? And I think at the simplest form, to say that someone is the son of God is to say that they're a godly person. You can look at, um, it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You see, um, kings are called the sons of God. Israel is called God's son. Um, many other people, angels, are called God's son. But Jesus is uniquely God's son because he is the only one that is actually perfectly godly. So begotten means Unique, that's what it means. It doesn't actually mean in the Greek there um, a, uh, a procreation. It just means that it, he is unique. Jesus is uniquely God's son because he obeys, because he perfectly represents the godliness of the Father. Did you want to say anything? Um, I'll just respond to the topic um, in the case because I didn't get a chance. So in, in Islam, giving attributes of Allah, sifats and names of Allah to something else goes against Tawhid. According to Islamic scripture, according to Islamic scripture, Allah does share his attributes with Jesus. According to Islamic scripture, when Jesus creates with his breath much faster than Allah, according to Islamic scripture, Allah shares his um, attributes with black stone when you kiss the black stone your sins are being forgiven and black stone is interesting for you according to islamic um, tradition 
Allah is sharing his attributes with his word um, on the day of judgment where word of Allah is going to intercede. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is now going to be the final question. Um, so this question needs to be for Sheikh Asrar. Does anybody have a question for Sheikh Asrar? I'm particularly interested in those who are uh, either not had a chance to ask yet. Um, is your question for Sheikh Asrar? No. Okay, I need a question. Last question for Sheikh Asrar. Does anybody have a question for the Sheikh? Okay. Thank you. Just there in the middle. Can you just pass the mic to the middle, please? Yeah, the uh, Amalekite point that you mentioned, revenge, go refer back to the, uh, um, uh, these first Samuel. You'll find that Amalekite was revenge for Israel, and it was taken on, uh, the revenge was taken on later generations. This is where I believe the modern Zionist state of Israel may be taking much of its violence from the Old Testament. Much of the violent is ta violence is taken from that. The, uh, and you mentioned... Uh, you mentioned the Quran, mentioned the story of Khidr and killing of a child. The point of mentioning the Amalekite point to you was that you cannot debunk Islam through Sharia because then you fall into Euthyphro's dilemma. How do you define evil? Is evil defined by the mind or is evil defined by scripture? Meaning the Christians have the same problem. But I will tell you in Islamic theology, uh, the evil is defined by the scripture, meaning revelation. That's the correct method. In Islam, we define evil by the scripture. You mentioned again, you salun. So you are not supposed to be speaking in tongues because the, uh, the passage you are saying is not a part of the Bible. So we're not supposed to believe in all the Bible because they are telling me that there are verses in this same Bible that are not Bible. So in this same Bible, it says you should be able to speak in tongues. Now, if you are able to speak in tongues, you will know you salon has multiple meanings. You keep mentioning that point. Go and check Lane's lexicon. It's found online. Go and check even Hansware Dictionary, a very simple dictionary. Even a person like yourself can understand that dictionary. A third point that you mentioned with regard to the question that was mentioning regarding did God beget a son? In the old editions of the translation, it's a translation of the Hellenistic manuscript known as the New Testament, the word Syed was used. Go and check the word Syed. Go in Google and write Syed. Syed means when a man has sexual intercourse with a woman and impregnates a God, Syed Jesus. This is, so this is what is uh, mentioned. It's, uh, you know, they use the word Syed for farm animals also. So that is what is exactly which is found. So those are some of the uh, additional points. I think reasons for becoming a Muslim, Muslims have retained the law, Muslims have retained the purity of Mary, because in the New Testament, Mary is a sinner also. Muslims uh, retain the purity of Mary, the purity of Jesus. Jesus is not cursed. You said he's not, he is not cursed. Go and read the passage again. It says Jesus was cursed because the curse of the law was taken away by Jesus, hence he became cursed and entered hell. The, the New Testament curses Jesus. The Quran does not curse Jesus. So for Christians, the best faith to choose is Islam because Islam exonerates Mary, exonerates Jesus, honors Jesus, and states Jesus wasn't crucified on the cross because in Roman times when a man was crucified, he was crucified naked. He didn't have the saddle cloth. He didn't have the napkin tied around. He was naked. And Islam says he wasn't naked. Okay, thank you. That, uh, that is all we have time for uh, this evening. So we're going to end with that. I've been asked to remind you of the feedback forms that are in front of you. Um, the Medina Society put a lot of work into organizing these events. They don't charge for them. So please do fill in the feedback forms before you leave. Uh, thank you for your participation and your attendance. Thank you. Good night.
Lexicon confirms Allah prays for Muhammad and then in the verse, if you read the verse, sir, it is between you and Allah and you are responsible for that. If you read the verse, it says Allah and his angels pray for Muhammad, all believers you do so. So there is nothing, there is nothing wrong. Muhammad is not talking about this. There is nothing. Muhammad is not confirmed. He doesn't have confirmed that Allah no, yes. He told you about it on the cash. Yes, on the cash. Muhammad is not confirmed. Allah does He's pray called, for Muhammad. So my question is, what is your definition of pray? What's your definition of pray? What's your definition of pray? What's your definition of pray? Sir, don't say that. Can you please bring me flexible? And earliest Muslim scholars, earliest including Ibn Kathir, tells you actually this is something. What is your definition of pray? What is your definition of pray? Sir, what was your definition of pray? In the Surah 33, verse 66, is the dua, is the essence of the worship, supplication. So now, the dua, and I must be the same. Sir, if you are going to pick and choose scholar, is, I would encourage you to go if to I, If I ask my 10 year old, sir? would you follow Jacob Sorry, well, what you're saying, you'll start laughing at me because sir? it's a critique that you is follow. Is that the child who is getting married in age 9? That's not the point. I just told you why I put my hand. Hold on, hold on. No, no, it's okay. I don't need to argue with you because I just said to you why I put up my hand. Why, yeah, only the why, why did so, I put up my hand? Why did I put up my hand? No, no, why did I put up my hand? Why did I put up my hand? Why did I put up my hand? See, now you're not going to that point because you know you got it. Why did I put up my hand? Why did I put up my hand? Why did I put up my hand? For Muhammad, why, why that's did, all it is. Why, I, I, if I pray for you, what does that mean? Do I worship you? Of course not. So similarly... But who do you pray? <laughs> who do you pray to when you pray for? Gotcha! Hold on. When who I do say you I pray, pray for you, so you pray, okay. Okay. I pray for God. I pray for God. I pray to God. You pray to God for me. So what I'm saying to you, no. something really simple. I'm very can, 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 yeah. You pray to Allah yeah. for me. Yeah. Okay. But, but, so but that salute does, does not mean it was worship. Allah does that, you need to learn Arabic. Do you know Arabic? Do you know Arabic? Do you know Arabic? Sir, you are not engaged with my question. I am. You do not know Arabic, so you can't. Who does? Who does? One who hears the prayer of Allah. So when you pray for me, then you pray for me. Salute means a blessing to be sent. Salute means a blessing. Replace the member as well. So member. Replace the so yeah. member. And, and when I, and, and hold that, when I, the blessing. Baraka is a blessing. Why Allah is not choosing to ibadat? use the word Baraka in Surah 33 verse why, why did he use Ibadat? Ibadat can, means can blessing. You, can you give me well, ibadat, ibadat means worship, sorry. Yeah. Well, ibadat means worship. So why, did, why didn't can he you use please? Ibadat? Why didn't he use Ibadat? Can you please? Why, why did he mean Salu, which means many words, but why did he use Ibadat? To make it very clear. What did he say? And the other thing is, why did I... Why did I... Hold on, hold on. Why did I put up my hand? No, no, why did I put up my hand? 
question was. Why did I put up my hand? Put your hand up if you want yeah. your child to marry. Yeah. You put your hand hold up. Hold on, so, hold on, hold no. on. So that's then I explain to you that's why. That's a, that's a then I explain question. to you why. Sir, then I'm not dealing with that. No, You're not engaging. Why don't you let him answer? And that is very not helpful. Why don't you let him answer? I already gave him enough time. I think that makes sense. I can see him with the fancier. Oh, yeah. He said, why didn't you drink the poison? Because of your faith. I've got a question, you know what he said? Why didn't you drink your poison? Because of your faith, as he said in your Bible. It has nothing to do with that. That's silly argument. I think someone just watched Amit either. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Excuse me, you said, you know, God and, you know, Jesus and God, the Father, they work dependently. They don't work independently, they work dependently. They don't, they don't do their own. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, they work like together. They work in, yeah. Together. So when Jesus was crucified, was part of God dead. When Jesus was crucified, part of God died. Yeah. Jesus, so, Trinity is not one part of God. Jesus is not the part of God. I already expressed, I'm sorry that even Quran and Muslim scholar tonight is misrepresenting. Yeah. What did I say? The Quran uh, scholar is misrepresenting. Misrepresenting what? Yes. The Trinity. Yes. But I would yeah. say that Which area of Trinity they are misrepresented? I have no idea. So, Christians don't believe Jesus is part of God. Okay. Christians don't believe Jesus is the entity in God. Christians believe Jesus is the Word of God who took up human nature and died on the cross for sin of man. But he doesn't have the same uh, uh, Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll ask an answer to what poison is it? Why do you have some poison? You don't Sorry? Know, have, you got, have you got a date? I don't need a date. It's, it's got plenty of dates. It's 2021. <laughs> oh, I did BNQ. I worked for BNQ for a week. There's a library in Dublin that has the P66 that I mentioned. Dublin is this is a city? A city yeah, or in, in, in Ireland. Like in Ireland? Yeah. Dublin, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, this, and this library, what's this? John? Yeah. John Ryland's library. Okay, thank you. No Hey guys, we'll do like a rap <laughs> Yeah, tell us, how, how did it go? How did it go? Okay. So I think a lot of my points were not actually answered. For example, we saw that Aisha was still playing with dolls, and that dolls was only permitted for people who were prepubescent. Uh, we didn't see Muhammad mentioned in the Old Testament, and we weren't really given a good reason to believe that Muhammad was a prophet. Um, I think all of the questions that were thrown at us can be answered quite easily, and many Christians actually already know the answers. So um, I'm going to actually put together a response to every single point that was made, and I'm going to put it on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's Caleb Cornelou, that's my YouTube channel. You can check it out from there. The channel may change to, I think, biblically, but we'll see how we go. But my initial thoughts are there's a lot to respond to that we couldn't respond to, and hopefully we get the opportunity to respond to on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you.